the meeting okay oh thank you yeah there we go does do Sarah and Tina want to make a statement or may I go right ahead okay a uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the first uh, forward Pinellas board meeting of this new year we have our board members here, but some staff, presenters, and members of the public will be joining us via Zoom as well today. And at this time, if those in the room uh, would please stand for the invocation and pledge, uh, which I will give today. And if you wish, will you bow your head um, as we pray? Dear wise and loving creator, first let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today, thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself, for the measure of health. We need to fulfill our callings for sustenance and for friendship and for leadership. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. We begin a new year of important planning for our community. I am asking you would graciously grant us these things the wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and righteousness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony even when there's honest disagreement, and the personal peace in our lives and joy in our task. It is in your most blessed name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I would like to uh, recognize uh, the following new board members. This is an exciting day. We have uh, four new uh, commissioners. Uh, I'd like to welcome Safety Harbor Vice Mayor Cliff Mertz, who's representing the cities of Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs, and returning to the forward Pinellas board, um, as I said, like a good penny. <laughs> um, Kenneth City Council Member Bonnie Noble, who's representing the inland communities. Pinellas Park City Council Member Patty Reed, representing uh, Pinellas Park. And Pinellas County Commissioner Pat Gerard. Um, would others please go around and introduce yourselves as well? And um, I'll begin 
with Commissioner Edgars and we'll go around. Pinellas County. Oh, and hit the button. Yeah, Pinellas speak. County Commissioner Dave Eggers. Me? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Vice Mayor Cliff Mers, representing the city of Oldsmar, Safety Harbor, and Tarpon Springs. Councilmember Brandy Gabbard, city of St. Petersburg. Karen Seal, Pinellas County Commissioner. Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> Councilwoman Patty Reed, representing City of Pinellas Park, and thank you for the welcome. County Commissioner Janet Long, thank you. Councilmember Bonnie Noble, uh, representing the inland communities from Kenneth City. Commissioner Pat Gerard, Pinellas County. Vice Mayor David Albritton, City of Clearwater. Largo Commissioner Michael Smith. Cookie Kennedy, mayor of the city of Indian Rocks Beach, and also representing all 10 of the beach communities. Let's hope for a joyful 2021. Good afternoon, I'm Whit Lanton, I'm the executive director. Thank you, and do we have any uh, commissioners who are in the Zoom meeting? Okay. So before we move on with the agenda, we will have our process coordinator, Tina Jablon, outline the procedures that will be followed for public comment today. Tina, would you please state the procedures? Good afternoon, everyone. I'll take the next few minutes to review the process that has been devised for this meeting. There will be a technology moderator and a process coordinator who will be tasked with facilitating the in-person and Zoom portions of our meeting today. The technology moderator in Zoom will be Sarah Caper, principal planner with Forward Pinellas and she shall be facilitating all the Zoom portions of the meeting. The process coordinator will be myself, Tina Jablon, Executive Administrative Secretary to Forward Pinellas, and I will be facilitating the in-person portions of the meeting. Any persons may be heard before the Forward Pinellas Board for not more than three minutes on any proposition before the board, unless such time is modified by the chair. The options and methods for doing that will be explained in a moment. To ensure an accurate record for this meeting, when addressing the board, the members of the public must first state and spell their name and state their address. Announce what agenda item they will be speaking to. Throughout the meeting, we will ask that all presenters and commenters identify themselves by name each time that they speak unless they have been properly introduced specifically um, by the chair. Additionally, please be mindful of not speaking over one another. Prior to any vote on a matter, the chair will seek public comment. First, the chair will inquire of the process coordinator if there are any members of the public physically present in the room who wish to address the board. The process coordinator will alert the board to the number of persons who have signed into the meeting and requested to speak. Each person will be given three minutes to address the board or time as modified per the chair. Next, the chair will refer to the technology moderator in Zoom who will ask for a virtual hand raising of all those in Zoom wishing to address the board. The number of hands will be noted and reported to the chair. The technology moderator will then unmute each speaker in turn in the order that is shown by Zoom and allow each speaker three minutes or time as modified by the chair. Finally, the chair may seek additional information from forward Pinellas staff, the presenter or other sources before entering a motion and a vote. The majority of forward Pinellas staff and presenters will be participating today via Zoom. We ask that everyone please silence their cell phones and other noise-making devices and ask that you allow all presentations to be final before interrupting with questions or comments. And with that, Council Member Rice, I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Tina. Uh, we're gonna move to citizens to be heard. Um, if there's any citizens wishing to be heard on any items not already on the agenda for action by the board today, today um, just a reminder, there's a limit of three minutes to speak. Tina, are there any members of the public in the room who wish to speak? No, ma'am, there are not. Okay, uh, thank you. Sarah, are there any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak? Any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak on this, please use the raise hand function in Zoom or press star nine if you're calling in. We do have one person with their hand raised. Uh, Todd Pressman, if you could state and spell your name and state your address, I will allow you to talk. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Todd Pressman, P-R-E-S-S-M-A-N, 200 2nd Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you. Please go ahead with your three minutes. 
Thank you. Uh, board members, Todd Pressman, Happy New Year. Um, I'm addressing you on an issue that I've been working with your staff for over a year regarding residential equivalents. You see, Ford Pinellas sets the ceiling on the number of beds in a group home or congregate care type home per the corresponding zoning category. For example, Hillsborough County laws five beds per, Manatee six beds, Pasco has no restrictions. Pinellas County is the very lowest of the entire Bay Area and surrounding counties. Now, I spoke at the housing symposium over a year ago that Councilwoman Gabbard and Commissioner Seal were at about this issue, which was accepted positively. And Witt said that he would look into it. Um, and I've tried to work with your staff since that time. But at this point, there's been very little movement except some bureaucratic movement. And staff wants to lump it together with a bunch of other issues and send it to each separate jurisdiction. Quite frankly, I don't think it'll ever see the light of day. It is completely within the power and authority of the Ford Pinellas Board to set the ceiling. This, these type of uses also include affordable housing. So I'm asking today that you direct your board, that board direct your staff, that this be a separate issue by itself, not lumped with other issues, and that it be expedited and brought to the four Pinellas board members to make a decision on this next month. This is a critical issue. Again, Pinellas County is the very lowest in the area. This is an element that does affect affordable housing. And when I spoke at the symposium, it was very well received. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pressman. Um, Sarah, is there anybody else in the Zoom meeting who wishes to speak? I see no other hands raised. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We will move on to recognitions and announcements. Um, I already welcomed our new board members, so we will move ahead to 4B, which is the recognition of our outgoing CAC member, Lee Allen. Um, what would you like to take over? Yes, <clears throat> uh, Lee is in the room and uh, we'll call Lee up uh, to the podium and we have a, a little award for him. And um, just, whoop, there we go, take the whole thing. Yeah, we'll do this. So, um, you know, we normally uh, recognize our Citizens Advisory Committee members when they are termed out. And uh, Lee has served on the Citizens Advisory Committee for eight years. We have term limits uh, on the CAC. Uh, Lee is an avid cyclist. He is a big Rays fan. Uh, he is a really smart transportation guy. Uh, he has provided a lot of good guidance uh, over the okay, years. And we really just want to acknowledge and appreciate your service. And uh, we've gotten you this biohazard device. <laughs> no, uh, it's actually a Ford Pinellas mug. Oh, great. Uh, so that whenever you drink your coffee, you can always think of it. Okay. Uh, we need to, uh, Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> Is that, is that the uranium? Yeah, that's the uranium about to go off. There we go. Uh, so I just want to say thank you very much for can your service. One, one or two things? Yeah, you can. I think uh, Chair Rice wants to say something, but why don't you go oh, oh. first and then she'll okay. uh, follow. I, I wanted to, again, uh, well, first of all, it was uh, Jeff Danner and uh, Bill Foster that nominated me for this uh, many, many years ago. And uh, I really enjoyed working with uh, Pinnell's, Ford Pinnell staff. Um, I mean, Sarah Ward and Witt. Al Barlotta, Sarah, uh, Robert, uh, Chelsea, all of them have a great, great staff to work with. And they uh, put up with the, I'll call it the uh, citizens at large that really think they know more than they really do, including myself. <laughs> so um, it was a, a pleasure to work with them. And uh, I will still, uh, I'll still be involved here and there, especially on the, maybe the BPAC uh, with the Ford Pinellas. But, uh, Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Lee. And uh, Cheryl Stacks, our transportation manager uh, from the city of St. Pete, helped me put together some, some words to express right now. Um, in addition to serving on the Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, you're an active community advocate for better and safer streets in St. Pete and Pinellas County. Uh, as an avid recreation cyclist, you've also served on the St. Pete Mayor's Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, or BPAC, since 2013. 
You've contributed to the success of several programs aimed at improving mobility in St. Pete. And using your business acumen and your finance background, in 2015, you served on the evaluation committee to select a bike share operator to establish Coast Bike Share in St. Pete, which was the first in Pinellas County. You continued your, serv your service with the BPAC in advising the development of the St. Pete Complete Streets Plan and the St. Pete's Micro Mobility Ordinance, both of which were successfully adopted in 2019. And most recently in 2020, you volunteered again to serve on an evaluation committee for the city, and this time for scooters, as St. Pete set out to launch the county's first scooter share program. So you're always on the leading edge, providing the sound, thoughtful counsel that elected officials seek out, and you're simply the best kind of citizen advisor that one could want. You've approached your role with an attitude of partnership, and you're confident enough to push for more when you see that there's a need to do so. His, your constant attention to the need for better buffers and planters on First Street South Bikeway along the southern end of the downtown waterfront help keep the city accountable in completing a picturesque and functional protected bike lane. Finally, you've worked as an advisor liaison to advance important and transformational projects. You're a member of the St. Pete Chamber of Commerce's Transportation Committee, and you helped to assuage that group to come to terms with the city's plan changes to implement a protected bike lane on Dr. M. L. King Street a project for which Forward Pinellas provided the city with an award. You continue to work with that group to, to, to participate in the current downtown St. Pete mobility study, also with Forward Pinellas, and that's expected to be completed this year and recommends significant changes to the way people move within and through the regional center that is downtown St. Pete. Uh, Mr. Allen, you are loved and valued by your city and by Forward Pinellas, and I thank you so much for your just unbelievable service to us all. Thank you. I'll have to thank Cheryl for those kind words. Yes. <laughs> She's... Uh, next, we will handle the consent agenda. Do any members wish to pull any items from the consent to be handled individually? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Tina, are there any members of the public in the room who wish to speak on the consent agenda? No, ma'am, there are none. And Sarah, are there any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak on the consent agenda? Anyone wishing to speak on the consent agenda in Zoom, please use the raised hand function in Zoom at this time, or if you're calling in, press star nine on the phone. We have no one wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing that there's no public comment on the consent items, I'll ask board members again if you now have any desire to pull any items for further discussion. If not, uh, I will hear a motion to accept the consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, that's unanimous, and we will uh, move forward. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to the public hearing section of our agenda in section five. There are no MPO public hearings today, so we're gonna move right into the PPC public hearings, which will be conducted as follows. I will first ask Forward Pinellas staff to present the items. Applicant local governments are available in in the Zoom room for questions as needed. Once the presentation is given, I will then ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents, and finally, any other citizens who wish to comment or ask questions on the case. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At that time, the board will ask questions and I will then close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. So 6A1 with the city of Tarpon Springs, it's case CW21-01. And we will be joined by our staff person, Nusheen Rahman. 
Thank you, Chair Rice. Good afternoon, and to the new members of our board, welcome. For the record, my name is Nosheen Rahman, and I serve as a planning analyst here at the agency. For context, the following presentations are regarding amendments to our countywide plan map, meaning that a local government has requested uh, a change to their land use categories, which corresponds to a change on our countywide map. The first case being presented is CW2101, submitted by the City of Carpenter Springs. The city seeks to amend a property from the residential low-medium category to the public semi-public category, and the purpose of the proposed amendment is to ensure that the existing use conforms to its appropriate countywide plan map category. The subject property is located on 324 East Pine Street, 424 North Ring Avenue, and 395 North Groves Avenue, with an area size of approximately 2.82 acres. It is currently used as the City of Tarpon Springs City Hall and Performing Arts Center, with surrounding uses including single-family residential homes and other institutional uses. The following is an image of the front of the subject property. Next, an image of the west of the subject property, followed by an image of the east of the property. And lastly, an image of an institutional use located just to the north of the subject property. The map in front of you portrays the current countywide plan map category of residential low medium with the permitted uses for the category listed on the table in front of you. This next slide portrays the same map, but with the density and intensity standards for the residential low medium category. This current category is not reflective of the current use of the subject property as city hall and performing arts center, hence the proposed amendment to the public uh, public category which is shown on this map in front of you, along with the categories permitted uses, followed by the public semi-public categories, density and intensity standards. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the public semi-public category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. In front of you is an analysis of the relevant countywide considerations mentioned before. And lastly, there were no public comments for KCW 2101 concluding this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Nusheen. Um, we will first ask for any proponents wishing to be heard. Tina, is there anyone in the room in the proponent? No, Madam Chair, there's not. Okay, Sarah, are there any proponents in Zoom who would wish to speak? I knew proponents in Zoom who wish to speak on this item. Please use the raised hand function in Zoom or press star nine if you're calling in on the phone. There are no proponents wishing to speak on this item. Okay, our next step is to ask if there's any opponents wishing to be heard. Tina, are there any opponents in the room? No, Madam Chair, there are not. Thank you. Sarah, are there any opponents in Zoom who wish to speak? Any opponents in Zoom who wish to speak on this item, please use the raise hand function in Zoom or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There are no opponents in Zoom. Thank you. And now we'll ask if there's any other citizens wishing to be heard. Tina, is there anyone in the room who wishes to be heard on this? Uh, Public hearing item? No, ma'am, there are not. Thank you. Sarah, are there any other citizens in Zoom who wish to speak? Any other citizens in Zoom who wish to speak on this item, please use the raised hand button in Zoom or press star nine if you're calling in on the phone. There are no other citizens wishing to be heard on this item. Okay, thank you very much. Um, seeing as the, as there are no opponents, proponents, or citizens wishing to speak. We will close the public hearing and we will move to question and answer among board members. Do any of our board members have questions about this item? Okay. Seeing none, uh, do I hear a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I, I hear a motion and do I hear a second? Second. And I see, hear a second from Commissioner Smith. 
Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. And we will move on to our next case and 6A2 on the agenda. It's case CW21-03, a city of Tarpon Springs. Um, and again, Nusheen, you'll, you'll provide the presentation. Thank you again. The next case being presented is CW2103, submitted again by the city of Tarpon Springs. The city seeks to amend a property from the resort category to the residential low medium category. And the purpose of the proposed amendment is to ensure consistency with the existing single family residential neighborhood and its appropriate land use category. The amendment area includes 19 lots located on Marina Drive with an area size of approximately 8.61 acres. It is currently a single family detached res residential subdivision uh, with surrounding uses, including single family residential homes, including a neighboring marina. As mentioned, the amendment area includes 19 individual lots. So the following images are meant to give you an idea of the character of the neighborhood. The first image is of the south of the amendment area, followed by homes located on the west of the amendment area. And lastly, a vacant lot that is mainly used for buffering, but is still part of the amendment area located to the east. The map in front of you portrays the current category of resort with its permitted uses listed in front of you, with the next slide showing the same map, but with the density and intensity standards for the category listed in front of you. This amendment area was originally platted in 1995 under the resort category. However, the neighborhood residents have privately initiated a request to change to a category which more appropriately, appropriately reflects the neighborhood's current use as single family residential homes, hence the proposed amendment to residential low medium, which is shown on this map in front of you, along with its permitted uses. The next slide shows the density and intensity standards for the residential low medium category. And as you can see, it is more reflective of the standards of a single family residential neighborhood. One of the countywide considerations taken into account is the location of an amendment area on the coastal high hazard area or CHHA, a portion of which this amendment area is found to be on. However, the proposed amendment will reduce the maximum allowable residential density from 30 units per acre under the current resort category to 10 units per acre under the proposed residential low medium category. Therefore, there will actually be no impacts to the CHHA. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the residential low medium category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. In front of you was an analysis of those countywide considerations mentioned. And lastly, there were no public comments for this case concluding this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. Um, so any proponents wishing to be heard? Tina, are there any proponents in the room who wish to speak? No, ma'am, there are not. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Are there any proponents in Zoom who wish to speak? Any proponents in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature at this time, or if you're calling in, press star nine on the phone. There are no proponents in Zoom. Thank you. Are there any opponents wishing to be heard? Uh, Tina, are there any opponents in the room? No, there are not. Thank you. Sarah, are there any opponents in Zoom who wish to speak? Any opponents in Zoom who wish to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There are no opponents in Zoom. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other citizens wishing to be heard? Tina, is there anyone in the room who is a citizen who wishes to speak? No, ma'am, there are not. Thank you. And Sarah, are there any citizens in Zoom who wish to speak? Anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There are no one, there's no one. Okay, thank you. And with that, we will close our public hearing. Um, 
we can now go to Q&A with our board. Do any board members have questions about this uh, public hearing item? Uh, Commissioner Smith, just be sure to hit your button. Yep. Okay. Uh, just curiosity question. Um, why was this started by the citizens and not the city? Probably proposed to the city. Um, we have our Turpin Springs staff available, Pat McNeese, to uh, perhaps answer that. Pat, you should be able to speak now. You might need to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good afternoon. This is Pat McNeese. I'm principal planner for the city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, the city has a provision in our code whereby 50% uh, or more of a group of citizens in a defined geographic area, which this neighborhood is, can petition our board of commissioners to initiate a land use change. Uh, in this case, uh, they petitioned the board, the board initiated the change and that's how it's coming forward. So we have a land use and zoning change on our end, and then the uh, countywide map change uh, that you're hearing today. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions about this public hearing item? Okay, seeing none, uh, do I hear a motion for approval? And do I hear a second? Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Great, thank you, that's unanimous. And uh, thank you, thank you, Nusheen. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. McNeese. Our next item uh, is under presentation and action items on section seven. We'll hear some reports starting with the PSTA activities report that will be given by Commissioner Janet Long. Uh, be sure to hit your button. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so the PSTA board last met on December 2nd, 2020, and we're happy to report that on November 23rd, we launched the first autonomous vehicle in the state of Florida run by a public agency that operated in mixed traffic. If you weren't able to join us for that inaugural ride, I hope you've been able to see our beautiful, bright, vibrant, brand new, uh, citizen in the city of St. Petersburg, Ava, who rides along Bayshore in downtown St. Pete. In her first week, almost 380 people were able to ride Ava and have a driverless experience. In the second week, she carried over 450 people. Since beginning, over 2,500 citizens have experienced this great PSTA innovation. We hope that the residents and businesses of St. Pete will enjoy Ava, and we're also looking forward to a positive word from t -Barta and FDOT about uh, bringing Ava to Dunedin and Clearwater in early 2021. The board approved the federally mandated public transportation agency safety plan for submittal to the Federal Transit Administration before the end of the deadline. While this plan is a relatively new requirement of the FTA in the prescribed format, PSTA was well prepared and already had many of the required plan elements all ready to go. Upcoming in 2021, we're looking forward to a great year in getting past COVID. In the next few months, we will be approving our new sustainable strategic plan, launching a new bus on shoulder system called BOSS on I-95, and putting new electric buses out on the road. We'll also be holding public engagement events online for the PSCA's next regular board meeting will be held on January 27th at 9 a.m. Thank you, everyone. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. No, that's my report, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long, I heard you refer to I-95. Did you mean 275? Did I say I-95? I guess I thought I was back in New England. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes, I meant I-275, of course. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank wanted to correct it for the record. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> We've got new people on the on the board today. So um, thank you very much. We'll move on to 7B, the T-BARDA 
activities report to be given by Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, this will be my last report because I am going off of the T. Barta board after approximately 10 years on the board. And um, so Commissioner Long is the new county representative, although she used to be the PSTA representative. And I am interested who they appointed from PSTA. Um, we had the, Commissioner Gerard, did we do the T. Barta one today? Oh, we're, well, we, our nominating committee met this morning, Commissioner Seal and we nominated Commissioner Flowers, but we won't vote on that until the 27th. So okay, hopefully it'll you. pass. So I was not able to attend the last meeting, but I do have the summary. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I couldn't attend the meeting was I was on the canvassing board. So I was certifying the election that day, um, but it sounds like it was a really interesting meeting. I wanna mention in particular, they recognize Commissioner John Mitten from Hernando County um, for his membership, he was also retiring from the T. Barta board. And Commissioner Mitten was a really, really great county commissioner, so, and a member of T. Barta, so I know he will be very um, missed. Um, he also was so strongly in favor of regionalism and truly did look at the big picture all the time. So, um, they also had a presentation from Whisk. Aereo Air Taxi Manufacturer, and then um, from the Leitner Poma Aerial Gondola Manufacturer overview as well. So if you wanna go on to, which I did, on to T. Barta's website, you might wanna look at the presentations because both technologies look really interesting. And um, I know that T. Barta is moving ahead as aggressively as it can at trying to uh, finish exploring the different technologies and literally getting it moving in the Tampa Bay area. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Seal. Um, Whit, did you have a few words? Yes, if I may. <clears throat> Commissioner, I'd just like to follow up on a couple things. You mentioned the aerial gondola um, project. We have reviewed a scope of services, provided some comments, and I believe that T. Barta is going to be issuing a request for proposals this month. Uh, for that feasibility study. Um, so that, that is moving forward. We're excited about that. That uh, specifically calls out studying the concept uh, in terms of its footprint, its operating characteristics, its cost, uh, how it will be funded in uh, downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach and in downtown St. Petersburg. I don't think we've identified a specific corridor in downtown St. Petersburg, but both will be evaluated and um, we will be happy to keep this board apprised of those discussions as they go forward. And then I'd also like to mention that T. Barta has done a kind of a neat thing with their communications. Uh, they've been doing a podcast um, that um, featured us this past month and that just went live today. Um, so uh, we will be sharing that on our social media and others. Sarah Caper and I spoke about the downtown mobility study in St. Petersburg specifically, but we also had an opportunity to talk about other things that we do at Ford Pinella. So I encourage you to listen to it when we get it out to you. That's exciting. I'm very thrilled about the aerial gondola. I can't tell you how many years ago I started meeting on this subject. <laughs> yeah. My hairs would be even grayer than they should be. <laughs> okay, thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Seal for your for your leadership, uh, you've had a strong presence on T-BARDA and have really guided that agency through ups and downs through the last several years. And um, thank you for your long term of leadership there. I'm sure you will be missed. Um, just a quick reminder uh, for those of you who are not uh, speaking right now, if you could please turn off your mic. If you see the red light on, uh, that means your mic's on. and. I'm going to remind you to try to shut that off because it creates feedback um, for people watching the meeting. So just a little reminder. And we're going to move on to our next item. It is an action item. We'll be taking a vote. This is the uh, Florida Department of Transportation draft tentative work program from uh, the 2022-23 year through the 2025-26 year. And I am going to ask our board members to please hold questions until after this presentation is completed. I think we all know 
uh, how important uh, this discussion is. And we are uh, delighted to have our Secretary Gwynn with us here today. And um, uh, we're gonna hear Secretary Gwynn give some remarks. And I believe we'll also be joined by a member of your staff, Justin Hall. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I think it's been a little while since I've been before the board and I know there's some new folks on the board and if you haven't already been contacted, if you're new, um, our staff should be getting with you to set up a meeting so uh, myself and our staff can talk to you a little bit about um, our role in the process and, and how we interact and also to hear from you about your questions and so forth. So I look forward to that. Um, so yeah, today, uh, Justin Hall and I are gonna talk about uh, a few things. So I wanted to set the table for him to come up and talk to you about the details in the five-year work program, but I thought it was important, um, even though I've already had discussions with Witt and, uh, and he knows most of everything I'm gonna say, I want to put some of this in context so you know what we're facing and, and how we're trying to uh, navigate our current situation. So. Um, a year ago, obviously, things look very different than they look right now in a lot of ways, but one of the ways was um, the amount of money that we projected we would have coming into the Transportation Trust Fund. Um, we were looking at a very robust economy. The Revenue Estimating Conference was projecting good, solid revenue growth, and, and uh, so our program was strong in, in, in that manner. We are the only state agency that operates under a cash flow basis, which means that we don't have all the money sitting in the bank when we sign a contract, and that helps us to move our big projects along quicker. The one time where that becomes a little harder is when you have something that you completely don't expect and you see a rapid decrease in your revenues, which is, is more or less what happened um, this year. So. The Revenue Estimating Conference sets for us um, the, the revenues that we statutorily have to match our five-year work program to. We don't have the ability to say, well, we're gonna program more and hope that it gets better or, or anything like that. We have to match our program to what the Revenue Estimating Conference um, tells us. Before the, the current situation, they were already starting to show a little bit of a decrease in our gas tax revenues primarily due to the increasing number of electric vehicles that are entering, entering into the market. And I've seen some articles recently that show that we continue to see um, battery technology and other things improving. Um, and DOT is supportive of that. We're actually building a, an infrastructure for electric vehicle charging, but the challenge with that is that it could and probably will um, reduce the amount of gas taxes we collect. And I know there's some laws this year being looked at to perhaps provide a surcharge on electric vehicles or something, but ultimately that'll have to be addressed. But then when we got the slowdown in the economy, our gas tax revenues slipped quite a bit, our toll collections slipped, our, our um, because of tourism being down, our rental car surcharge income went down as well as did um, a lot of our uh, other fees related to licensure and registration. The only bright spot in there, quite honestly, was the um, dock stamps, which went up. And um, the one bright spot out of that, the dock stamps went up. It gave us more money to use for, for matching New Start Transit projects. So our region was able to get uh, $67 million to help with the modernization extension of the Tampa streetcar system. So. That was one thing that was positive. But overall, um, we end up with about a $1.4 billion deficit that we had to cover through our five-year work program. We were really worried about the current year because that's where a lot of the, the, the initial hit was gonna take place. And initially, um, we were not able to hit a lot of the programs around the state because they were set at statutory le levels. Um, the governor did issue a executive order that allowed us to kind of spread the, the cuts throughout the entire program and that helped this year. If that had not happened, we most likely would have had to stop some construction jobs and that would have been a, a very bad thing. So um, there are some things that we have held harmless, if you would, from reductions. One is we're not going to halt any ongoing construction projects. We're gonna honor those, we had $14 billion worth of outstanding obligations based on our previous estimates. So we wanted to hold those harmless, keep those projects like the Gateway Project, the Howard Franklin Project, and other projects throughout, um, keep them going. 
Of course, we have to pay our debt service on any bonds or anything else that we have. Um, any planned safety projects were held harmless in the program, as well as any preservation-related projects, things to keep our roads and our bridges in good shape. We also were hit somewhat by, um, by our federal funding. When the FAST Act was extended by one year, uh, one of the requirements in there was that every state had to receive back a certain rate of return on what they put in. 47 states, including Florida, ended up taking a slight cut in our allocation because of that. That should be fixed when we get a new bill. But for this year, we saw a little less than we otherwise um, might have seen. So what that ended up happening was the majority of the, the money that we had available to cut was in our strategic intermodal system program. The strategic intermodal system program is unique uh, from a lot of our other programs in that it is really looking not at a region by region or district by district um, work program, it's looking from a statewide basis. It's there in order to promote regional projects that support statewide mobility, things that move people and goods throughout the state. And so many of our major projects on our major roadways like the interstates, US 19, State Road 60, others are funded through this. District 7 had um, the biggest project in the five-year work program in the SIS, which was the West Shore Interchange. And so uh, when we had to start looking to cut the money out of that program, um, we, we did understand that we were probably going to see some impact to that. Initially, the uh, first round showed that that was going to move out of the five-year work program into the second five. Um, through working with our central office, we were able to get that back into the five-year work program, which more or less secures its space much more, more so than being in a second five. Um, however, um, it did get moved from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 26. Um, what that means is instead of letting the project to a contractor in about two and a half years, it's probably going to be in about four and a half years. Um, unfortunately, there were other changes, and some of them here in, in, uh, in, in Pinellas County. So segment two, which was originally going to be in uh, fiscal year 2025, was moved into the second five, um, tentatively put in year 2031. Um, fortunately, we were able to uh, maintain US-19, the two US-19 projects in their current uh, place, and so they weren't impacted. Um, but we also had some other projects in Hillsborough County uh, that were impacted as well. So I can tell you we were very disappointed that we got uh, these projects deferred. I know there's been a lot of work put in by a lot of folks, including yourselves, to build the regional consensus to get these projects going. So um, that being said, you might ask, you know, what is our strategy going forward? How, how do we, you know, how do we respond to this? Well, the first thing I'll say is that we are not, um, we're not taking our foot off the pedal when it comes to being prepared for these projects. Um, we're proceeding as if we're still going to have the West Shore Interchange in 24 and we're going to have segment two in 25. Um, I have some optimism that that could very well end up being the case. And so we'll continue to buy the right of way, get the permits, get all of our approvals from Federal Highway, and we'll be ready for those projects uh, in the original years, if not sooner. We also um, are optimistic that there will be some additional funds coming in the not too distant future. We know that there was $10 billion worth of funds for state departments of transportation in the most recent COVID relief bill. We do not at this point know exactly how much Florida will get and we do not know exactly what the rules are on how that money has to be spent both on what and during what time frame. But I've been having conversations almost daily with our central office about how we could try to move our projects back in with that money, as well as any potential stimulus money. We hear that there's a good uh, potential for a stimulus for infrastructure. Um, and although we may not be able to move, for instance, the West Shore interchange into next year, because we still have right away to buy, we still have some things, if we can move other projects in to take that money from those years where we need the money for West Shore and Segment 2, perhaps then they can slip in behind and go back in their original position. Um, we, we 
do think that we can get segment two ready fairly quickly. It may potentially be a good stimulus project depending on how much money there is and the rules that are applied to it. So um, with that, I, I guess you're gonna hear from Justin today some things that are a little disheartening given all the work that's gone into building the program and, and getting the consensus in the region. But I think there is some good news in there and I can tell you in my discussions with Secretary Tebow, he has committed that um, the projects that got impacted will be the first ones given, you know, assuming that the rules allow us to, to be the ones to get the benefit of any incoming money. And so we'll stay on top of that. But I also, and we spoke to the Hillsborough MPO this morning and I told them, I said, we need to remember to keep thinking regionally and to make sure that, um, I know folks are talking to their legislators or business community is talking to folks and we remember that as a region, we speak pretty loud um, as individual counties, not as much, still significant, but as a, as a region, we speak loud. And so that, that loud voice is gonna be needed because the conversation I'm having with you, I'm sure that they're having similar conversations in Miami and in Orlando and other places that had projects deferred. And we wanna make sure that, uh, that we're first in line. So um, I'll be glad to come back after Justin uh, gives his talk and uh, we both can try to answer any questions that you might have. So I'll have Justin come up now. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Justin Hall for Department of Transportation. Uh, so the first couple slides that I'm gonna go through, this is really kind of housekeeping. So if you've, if you've been here before, this is gonna be old news and if, if you've never been here before, then this may be kind of cool. So uh, next slide. So the tentative work program, which is what we're uh, discussing here today, uh, is for starting next fiscal year, and it'll be for a five-year period. Um, and really, the transition happens July 1st, you know, of this year. Uh, year one is included in the state proposed budget, so we like to say that's the the one year that is guaranteed, uh, generally, with the exception, obviously, of something like what happened this year. And then two two through five, those are our commitments to future years. Uh, next slide. So we prepared kind of a little animation to explain it because it, it's, it's really hard if you're not working in it uh, uh, every day to kind of understand. So right now we're in the five-year plan. It's adopted. Fiscal year 21, which is what we're in now, you know, is the, the first year. Um, it includes, you know, public transit, seaport, airport, rail projects, really just a really robust uh, list of projects of all kind of transportation. And it includes also planning activities and ITS and things of that nature. Next slide. So what we're doing now is we're going through the tentative work program process. And so every year on June 30th, the fiscal year ends, and then July 1st, our new fiscal year begins. So we have to be prepared for that new current year. Next slide. So what we have to do is we have to plan or game out the new fifth year, which is what you know, we've been working on you know, for the past couple months. And new projects are added in the new fifth year based on a litany of priorities, you know, whether it be the FTP goals, statewide priorities, and even local priorities like the MPO has. Uh, next slide. So in the process, where we are is we've prepared a tentative work program document that we like, you know, uh, that we've done the best that we can based on the priorities we have, you know, and based on the funding available. And we're here to present that to you. Now, after we present it to you and, and you guys take action of you know, support or, or ask us to reconsider things, uh, it'll go to the Florida legislature and if they support it, then it goes to the governor's office and it's, it's signed into the bill. Next slide. And then that becomes our new adopted. So that's how we get to, so when you hear us talking about tentative or adopted, adopted is always the, the program that we're working off of. Tentative is the future program that we're working towards. Uh, next slide. So this I really see as a first then and finally. So first, what we're looking to do is preserve the existing program. So any unfunded phases on a project, uh, if anything came up over the previous year that the project needs additional right away, we're trying to preserve the program that we had from a past year. So then after we do that, then we look at cost estimate updates. So, you know, was there a cost overrun? You know, uh, was there an accident or a problem that had been identified where we need to add a signal? So we're just looking for those cost estimates that uh, went up. And then finally, it's adding new projects. Next slide. And go ahead and do next slide. Sorry, we'll go ahead and bring that animation in. So when we're looking at projects, you know, obviously safety is our number one priority. So we're always looking at safety. And with safety comes security. 
And, and really beyond that, it's system preservation, multimodal, you know, there's a lot of factors that we're looking at for projects. And then, like I said before, there's a, there's a variety of priorities that we're following. So whether it be, you know, the MPO priorities, uh, the regional priorities uh, established by the TMA, or CIS, you know, DOT priorities. Next slide. And then what, what comes after that? It's, it's the new, you know, the new stuff added, whether it be new phases, new projects, or just, you know, projects of interest. And we're gonna cover those today. So uh, next slide. The, the projects that you're gonna see here, these are all projects that had some type of a change. So if you saw a project last year that you're really excited about, if it's not in the slideshow, it's still in the program. This is just things that were either added or removed. So just kind of keep that in mind. So this slide, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the top line, this is a WITS uh, SU uh, planning dollar. So obviously we, we program the fiscal year 26 uh, funds. This is a rolling priority that we fund every year. Uh, the next one's the Tampa Bay Regional uh, uh, Planning Model funding that the uh, MPO that you guys provide to the DOT to help prepare that regional model. And the next one is a PSDA bus replacement. So we added uh, capital enhance or improvements into fiscal year 26. Next slide. So the first one there, that is our uh, section two. So unfortunately that was our one of, bit of our bad news, uh, which construction was deferred from fiscal year to 25 uh, to fiscal year 31. And I think everyone knows that project, but that's to add lanes and to have lane continuity from downtown St. Petersburg all the way across the Howard Franklin Bridge and then eventually through the West Shore Interchange so you can pick a lane and stay in it. Uh, the next one is uh, Urban Corridor Improvement Project on uh, Skinner Boulevard. This was a uh, previous um, Safe Streets uh, grant program that the Fort Pinellas selected this project. So it was a Fort Pinellas pretty high priority. Next slide. So. This project, and, and you're gonna see it a little bit later, you're gonna see an Alt-19 project that actually is coming off of the list. Uh, this project is a new um, uh, low bid design build project that we added to, to enhance the Alt-19 at Causeway Boulevard uh, intersection. This is to address uh, several operational issues there, both from a pedestrian standpoint and vehicular standpoint. Um, the other project was a long stretch of Alt-19, which really ha didn't have a path to victory for funding. It was such a large project. so. What we've done is working with the MPO staff, we've got target intersections along Alt-19 that we're literally gonna work through every year. So this is the first on the list. Uh, next project, Drew Street. I know this is one, uh, Commissioner Eggers, that uh, we've heard a lot about. Uh, we spent a lot of time out there in the field looking at this project, and we've added uh, design funds in fiscal year 22 and construction in 24. So we're gonna solve that pretty quickly here. Next slide. Uh, this one, uh, this is really closing the gap from the recently completed uh, design build project on Gandy Boulevard all the way to the bridge. Uh, this is, we're adding, we're adding construction funds in 25, removing them in 24, and the reason for that deferral is the PD&E uh, project has not gotten started yet, so we're not really even ready to move into design. So this is kind of just regular business at the DOT that we just weren't able to make it in time for that. And the US-19 project here, this one's a little hard to understand. This is actually a turn lane improvement and pedestrian improvement project that we're working with the MPO. We added right-of-way funds in fiscal year 24, but we're working to try and avoid that right-of-way, and if we can, we'll construct that project in 24. Next slide. Uh, so here are my two Alt-19 projects that we removed that I discussed earlier. Uh, just there was no path to victory for these, so next slide. So Gulf Boulevard sidewalk improvements, I know everyone was very familiar, or a lot of people were familiar with the drainage improvements we had out there. There were obviously some sidewalk gaps that needed to be addressed. Uh, this is a PD&E slash feasibility study to look at those uh, sidewalk gaps and see how we can uh, plan to get those designed and constructed. Next slide. <laughs> You're welcome. It's, it's funny, there's a lot. There's a lot going on, and I'm really trying to fly through it because I know you guys, and so I appreciate it. Um, so the next two projects, you know, these are some urban corridor improvements. What that means, uh, those are complete streets projects. So a lot of times, you know, we're uh, either connect, connecting sidewalks, uh, bike lanes, you know, really trying to change the, the uh, feel of the corridor. So 28th Street North and Central Avenue, two important corridors. Next slide. And this is a safe routes to school uh, sidewalk improvement. The construction was added in fiscal year 26. So we just are constantly adding new projects, you know, as part of the SRTS program. Next slide. Um, same thing, so really the next couple slides will be resurfacing projects, rigid pavement, uh, and then with those, there's a lot of urban corridor improvements that'll go with them. The very first project was actually a project that the um, city of St. Pete had advertised and there were some uh, cost overruns. And so 
uh, we've just, we've added funds in fiscal year 22 to help with the construction of those urban corridor improvements and it's closing some sidewalk gaps and, and some turn lane improvements. Uh, next, the next one is a resurfacing project. So next slide. So same thing, we've got a resurfacing on SR60. Uh, this is this one we had design and construction funded in the five year program. And then the I-375, the concrete uh, rehab, there's some uh, um, surface cracking and all out there just from regular wear and tear that we're gonna repair in fiscal year 24. Uh, next slide. US-19 uh, resurfacing, so you'll see there's a lot of work going on you know, out in that area. Uh, design in 22 and construction in 24, and the same thing, Alt-19, uh, some uh, resurfacing plus a complete streets project going with it. So you'll see that's where we're resurfacing the project or the roadway, but while we're out there, we're gonna do some sidewalk connections and bike lane uh, connections as well. Next slide. So these are, uh, these are two uh, bridge repair projects. Um, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, just pretty much regular maintenance for the district. Next slide. And uh, Drew Street, Fort Harrison, uh, added design in 23, construction. This was a, really the next three slides will be ATMS projects that we worked with uh, Pinellas County on, and these are funded through SIGP, which is a matching grant program. So we've got uh, Drew Street, 580, uh, next slide. Uh, Causeway Boulevard, and what we're building here and, and what the county's working on too is, is this is a, a ATMS network. So when we talk about like Honeymoon Island State Park, when we talk about Alt-19, we talk about some of these east-west corridors like Skinner, this is gonna help traffic flow and help us to manage some of the congestion. So these projects, they kind of go hand in hand together and, and they're all really good projects. So next slide. Um, so these are two landscaping projects. Uh, the US-19 offering project, I believe that there was some landscaping that was planted there and there were some problems, so we're gonna go back out and, and replace some of the plants in 22. And then the Olmerton, this is a new beautification project in 22. Next slide. And then here's a few more. Uh, the Long Bayou, SR60, Court Street, Pinellas County, these are uh, various maintenance projects throughout the district. Next slide. And then of course, this is our, our project of interest, so Al Albert Witted Airport. Uh, this is a, a apron rehab that's going on on taxiway A. So next slide. So what does this say? You know, over a five year period, it's $581 million of investment in the program. Um, I, I'll save you the details of going through it, but it's really just a, it's a really a mix of uh, capacity, resurfacing, transit, you know, just kind of a little bit of everything. Next slide. And the, the big takeaway for us, you know, with the exception of obviously the projects, uh, we have our online uh, work program public hearing that's going on right now. Uh, you can access it through www.d7wpph.com, kind of a mouthful. Um, there you can see all the projects, not just the projects that changed. You can provide comments on any projects. Those projects come to our team and then we can either respond to you or we can look and see if there's something that we can do to kind of help out on a project. And of course, obviously the uh, you know, MPO objections are due February 12th. We're hoping that you don't have any objections. You know, we, we appreciate comments, but we're hoping you don't have any objections. And then obviously this work program would, would go forward to be adopted, so. Next slide. So thank you. And I think from there we can answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you, Justin, uh, for that presentation. And uh, thank you, Secre Secretary Gwen. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions to get started with. Um, board members? Uh, Commissioner Seal. So um, the five-year work plan um, is now almost 582 million. How much was it previously? Yeah, the, the, that loss is the section, what you're seeing is section two loss. Uh, it was about 300 million from section two and then uh, there were some other reductions across the board. I can get you an exact number, I'm not sure exactly what it was. But 300 million is across uh, district seven. Well, no, actually the, the section, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm like yelling into the microphone. Section two uh, was about $300 million uh, in Pinellas County. In Pinellas, yeah. okay. And how about Hillsborough County? What kind of reduction did they see? So Hillsborough County, they lost, um, they had a project that was about $100 million that was coming into the new fifth year program, and then obviously the West Shore Interchange uh, project, that's, you know, the final figure. No, but I, the West Shore Interchange is a unique project because it's a design build finance project, which means the, the money's programmed, not necessarily in the, in the year that it's gonna be earned or paid, 
earned by the contractor, but the year that we pay it out. So when the contractor bids, he knows when he's going to get paid, but he probably is going to have to do some gap financing in it. So I believe it was a, a few hundred million that was moved out of the two years out um, of that. But the, the 1.4 billion was never in the five-year work program. Only a portion of that was, and now a smaller part is, but because the first year is, the rest of it pretty much would have to follow. You couldn't just stop it at one year. Mm -hmm. um, the project on 118th on US 19 to 66, Avenue. I'm assuming that's the Gandhi Park. Yes, it is. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yeah, turn lanes and yes. So are you, you're not going to build a whole new interchange at this point. Just do because I was pushing through WIT to do some kind of interim solution. Y yes, ma'am. This is the interim solution. Uh, there, it's additional turn lanes, uh, some traffic operations improvements there at the intersection, and then there's a discussion about the pedestrians whether you know we can protect them there at the intersection or whether we shift them to the west, but they're. But that, that's the interim project. Okay. That's it for now. But. If I could just add real quick, we had a meeting in December with the City of Pinellas Park and the department staff on that. Um, the, the issue of adding the second southbound left turn that you add, I think we can do that. Um, it would mean eliminating a bike lane for about 1,800 feet, which I think is the right thing to do. But we want to make sure that there's safe access for bicyclists around that area. And we were looking at 40th Street uh, as a possible connection because there's a signal at Park Boulevard right by the mall. So maybe routing them down 40th Street. But Pinellas Park doesn't have the right of way on 40th Street anymore. So we, we're going to continue to work that issue. My understanding is that was about a million dollar type of project. And I had a question on that, if I may. Um, is that the one that you said would be FY24? I kind of thought the $1 million project could be done maybe faster. Yeah. So, so what we did, uh, because there were several different improvements that were discussed. So there was a, a right turn lane coming off of the one ramp. And I think there was some right of way needed there. Was it a car dealership or, yeah. And so what we did is we went ahead and programmed right away in the earliest year we could, which was 24. Uh, those funds are obviously committed to the project so we can, we can convert it to construction if there's an interim improvement. Ultimately, I know from talking with uh, Director Moss that we would like to advance that project. And I think right now it's just trying to get through the right of way issue and if we can do all of our improvements inside the right of way, then, then we'll move forward. Good, because that's really a necessary project. I agree. And <laughs> I understand um, that, I understand the budgeting, but I do hope that we can get US 19 at Tampa and Nebraska moving back into the plan in short order. We've waited patiently and taken our turn. But um, anyway, I. This is my last term in office, and I sure like to see it ready to be constructed. <laughs> well, just like Secretary Gwynne said earlier, we are not stopping, so we're still moving forward with the planning study, still looking at the intersection, so we will keep moving. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Secretary Gwynne, thank you for being here, and thank you for your opening comments. Um, I know you truly are a champion for our district here, and I um, really appreciate the work that goes on. And as I've said many times, I really, really have enjoyed the, you know, the improving and developing relationship between our MPO and, quite frankly, the region and, and your or, and FDOT. So just a couple of questions. Um, the US-19, you said there's two projects. Are we talking about Curlew and then the frontage road projects, or what do we, is that when you separate the two projects? Yeah, it, it's the next two projects up. So it's the two that we've been talking about. So Curlew, including the north side improvements with the pedestrian crossing. So it's, it is that entire corridor and, right there. Okay, and yes, from Curlew to 580. Yes, sir. That whole yes, area. Sir. Okay, and um, and I agree with Commissioner <laughs> Commissioner Seal about um, Tampa Road. Obviously, that's probably, I, as I see it, probably our last one. Maybe, I mean, we still have to talk about Tarpon. Yeah. Anybody here from Tarpon? No. Um, the Tarpon interchange. But I mean, at this point, that seems to be the last one and certainly hope we can get that back in. Really happy about Drew Street. Could you explain a little about what that means in terms of the finishing design, what year that would be, uh, any, any more public outreach, and then the construction? Okay. What, what is the, uh, the detail on Drew Street? So, so right now we're in the process of completing a planning study in coordination with the MPO, the county, and the city. 
Uh, so there will be some public involvement with that. And then following that, there'll be a recommended alternative coming out of that or, a, you know, a proposed alternative. And that would be what we move into design. And we funded design so quickly because the kind of at the first glance with the study and from what we've seen, you know, everyone seems to agree that something needs to happen out there. Uh, so we, we have what we call the SWAT process internally. So we try to look at any opportunity to advance design if we can uh, when it makes sense. And this was an opportunity. So we're really just trying to line up design that as soon as the planning gets far enough along that we can start design of the improvements out there that we can start. And then construction's following about as quickly as we can do, which is about a two year turnaround. So and, that just from a timing standpoint, what do you anticipate with those three phases? You call it the planning phase, the design phase, and then the construction start. I believe we're, our target is to try and be in design within nine months from now, and uh, then we'll follow up with construction within two years. Okay, so within the, within that five year we're talking. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and then last question I had was, um, really, I'm glad we're moving forward with the intersection at uh, Alt 19 and Curlew. Really, uh, obviously, a big deal from many standpoints. Have we already started to target the next ones that are prioritizing the next ones? I mean, I know that you're going to get some input from 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 Wit and the county and that kind of thing, but yeah. Yeah, Whit, I don't know if you want to cover that one or if you want me to, but okay. So, so really what we, we started the process just recently with the MPO in the county trying to see what the next target would be. I know that the, one of the intersections we were looking at was to the south uh, in, inside Clearwater. And then there's also an intersection to the north in Tarpon Springs that we're looking at. But really that, that's kind of a dynamic process. So we're trying to look at some of the crash data and, and okay. crash history and operations to select them. But we're working pretty closely with WITS, WITS team. We want to make sure that uh, we have consensus in the cities. And uh, so we think some of the recommendations in Clearwater uh, through that Myrtle Street corridor make a lot of sense but I'm not sure that the city of Clearwater is completely unified on that. So okay. we're going to be meeting with them uh, about that. And then, uh, of course, uh, Dunedin has pretty strong interest in being number two, three, four, and five on that list of priorities. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, of course. So I, I've heard from the city of Dunedin about that. Um, and then we just want to make sure that there's equity in how we look at that quarter because there's needs all the way up. Yeah. Okay, so it's still kind of a work in progress. We're, we're meeting with the staff and, okay. and making sure they understand the options and, and making sure they're on board. Okay. Thank you again, Secretary, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for your presentations. And Secretary Gwen knows that I am not happy about any delays that slow down any improvements on the West Shore interchange. My goodness, that's so just the traffic there is awful. And to think that it could be delayed for up to five years or more, I can't even imagine. I mean, we're already 40 years behind the times. And it really doesn't seem fair to me that our dollars could end up going to Central or South Florida or even over to Jacksonville, because those folks have already done improvements that we haven't even begun to do yet. It's our turn. So, what are you laughing for? <laughs> well, on top of that, I hope that they're all paying attention to the fact that the leadership in the House and the Senate is coming from our area. They don't usually do things like that to people that are in leadership. Bad things happen, just FYI. <laughs> well, I think that was more of a statement than a question. I'm gonna stand at an angle so you're not completely behind me. <laughs> <laughs> if there's somebody. I there. think they planned it that way. <laughs> I had one other comment when you get a chance. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Eggers. On, the, on that, thank you, Commissioner Long, for saying that because well, it's I, true. It is absolutely true. Thank um, you. And I, I just, you know, we've been told, as you you pointed out, we've been told to speak as a region, and I, I was just so proud of the fact that such a diverse region came together: uh, city commissions, county commissions, MPOs, and we picked one. And just it just obviously is clearly disappointing that we got pushed back and. Um, and again, I think that the, the real disappointment, we all know that everybody got pushed back a little bit, except one area seemed to get pushed up a little bit. And that was the part that was most disturbing that 
when it, when, it, when it really was a time for if anybody was going to get pushed forward, we might. I think that was the, the disappointing part. But um, anyway, just uh, I guess for the record, I share those comments that Commissioner Long said. It's very disappointing. Thank you. Whit. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, let the board members know that I'm really appreciative of the department and their transparency and their clarity on all this. Uh, we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, Secretary Gwen and Justin has been great. Richard Moss has been very helpful. And they've explained the context of this decision-making process very clearly to me. It gave me enough information that, um, you know, when I'm speaking to our legislative delegation or when I'm speaking to our partners, whether it may be at the Chamber of Commerce or at a city council, that um, I can give them the same context without you guys having to be there every time. And um, um, Secretary Gwynn did share with me, we requested um, a funding breakdown of these deferrals across the state. And I just got that information a couple of days ago, but we will make sure the board members see that as well. And it is disproportionate, and I think that's because we have the most to lose. We have the most money in the, in the work program, and when you have that big of a, of a deferral, you know, that's probably where you have to make the cuts. Um, but it is disappointing to see other regions. Um, I mean, this is an order of magnitude much greater of an impact than Miami, Fort Lauderdale, or other regions. Um, so again, thank you very much for your transparency and, and information about all that. Um, thank you. Do we have any other questions from board members we haven't heard from yet? Uh, yes, Vice Mayor Mertz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for, <clears throat> am I allowed to take this off the talk? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Being new on, on this, obviously I have a bunch of questions and we'll get those questions answered with Witt and, and the rest of the board later. But I guess I have a question as to, uh, I understand the, the <clears throat> issue of safety as, as being important. And there happens to be <clears throat> one area that on, which looks here to be between 688, 686, Roosevelt, Omerton, that to me always has been a potential area of um, of concern, and I drive that area for the last 22 years and have seen as Omerton grows, the same thing happens even though lanes are put in at the same location. So there must be some particular reason why that occurs. But specifically, if you when you when you get off of 275 and you get on to 686 and uh, 688, as you're making that progression, there's a place there where uh, and as you come up to Stony Brook Avenue, you have basically two lanes and then there's a stop. And then, so between the stoplight where the Chick-fil-A is and the stoplight where the CVS is, you've got everybody coming off of two that cram into that area. But then once you're past Stony Brook in two blocks, you now, you move back and a new lane is now being created and opened right after the, um, uh, the cracker barrel. So a, a simple question would be is why couldn't that two blocks, that lane be opened so that when cars are coming off of 275 and there's two lanes coming and they continue down, they would then continue and those that are interested being in that far right lane would then continue to go past the airport and, 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 and I, have, I can't tell you how many times I've seen either accidents or, or you know, rude gestures and all kinds of problems of, of everybody having to merge in from that lane who's not making a right-hand turn, and then only two blocks later having to cut back out again. And so I don't know what the appropriate form is, and uh, forgive me to all the other members for if that's the appropriate, not appropriate protocol, but to me it's, it, it would be a, um, somewhat simple, low-hanging fruit type of issue to take care of some safety at that point. I've seen the numerous accidents that have occurred because of that. And, um, and I don't know if that happens to be falling under what would be listed here, but I see it as landscaping, so I don't really think that that would be the, the appropriate case for it. But how does things like that get put into the long-term plan for discussion? Well, there's Thank a number you. of ways that it can, but probably the easiest thing we can do right now, I'm not, I can't say I'm entirely familiar 
with that, but we can go back and, and ask our traffic operations folks to take a look at it. Depending on how much work it is, we do have what we call a, a, a design build push button program, which is to try to get quick fix type things, low hanging fruit done in a quick manner without having to go through the whole process. And um, it may be that it would be something that would fall into that. I'd have to check to see if it's a right of way issue or what that might be, but we can certainly look into it. Do you know where he's talking about? Yeah, and I, I think some, some of that, the lane, the shifts and patterns are gonna change a little bit with the Gateway Expressway opening up and some of that work as well. So, but we'll definitely take a look at it. Yeah. I mean, we can take, bring it back to our traffic operations group and take a look at it. I appreciate that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your recognizing me again. And I want to say this very respectfully. You know, I'm very fond of the Department of Transportation. But I do feel important to push back just a little bit on what our illustrious leader just said in terms of the disproportionate cuts because we had so much money at risk. But my goodness, the reason we had that much money at risk is because we've been so far behind and the monies have been going to other regions within our state and everything, those of us that have advocated in the legislative arena or been in the legislative arena, the one thing that we kept hearing was, well, those people, the people in South Florida, Central Florida, Jacksonville, they got their large share of the money because guess what? They spoke as a region. So now for the first time ever, in the decades that I've been involved in working on these issues, we are trying desperately to hold the region together and speak as a region, and then look at that, we get penalized. It's not right. Sorry, Whit. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I, we've made every attempt possible with our central office folks to, to, to advocate on behalf of our region. Um, and you know, a little bit in their defense, normally we wouldn't go through a, a process to reconfigure our work program so drastically in such a short period of time without notice that it was coming. So I think a lot of things was to try to get the program balanced and I think there's a lot of anticipation that it's, this is not what's gonna be the final form of it. I think there's more money and, and resources to come and so um, my first, quite honestly, my first, and they didn't like me too much for it, but my first one was, no, let's take money from there, or there, or there, and put it here, back here. We need to be, I think now we're looking at it more like, well, when that money becomes available, it needs to come here first. Thank you. And so that's really the approach that we're trying to take, and I think they're receptive to it. Um, I didn't, I didn't um, envy them having to go through that balancing program. It was not an easy process and I think in the numbers it does look like we were hit disproportionate but they'll remind us that you know we have Gateway and Howard Franklin and others that are ongoing and so but I, I still think I think the news the bad news is is in when we look back on it five six years from now it won't be nearly as bad as what we think it is now at least that's my my hope Well, I said five or six years, because by then I'll be eligible for Social Security. <laughs> if you get mad at me, then I guess I can. <laughs> All right. uh, thank you. Uh, I have some questions as well, and I, I certainly share in the disappointment that my colleagues have expressed, but to kind of pivot to what we can do next, I did have some questions, uh, Secretary Gwynn, that you had made about our strategy, and you said that we, on the Section 2 piece especially, that we could still continue to move forward with buying a right-of-way and uh, getting permits done. Is there anything that we need to be aware of? Are there any regulatory limitations with pursuing that? Is if, if something gets bumped too far back, does that limit the ability to do right of way? And with the permits, does starting the permits, is there any kind of time limit? Does that start like a clock ticking that we have to be aware of? And we're keeping track of all that. Um, so we only have one parcel of right of way to buy and it's for mm -hmm. a pond. Right. And um, we don't think it'll be a very complicated um, mm -hmm. uh, purchase. So that would be normally the thing that would hold us up the most, because that can be lengthy if the property owner contests the taking. 
Um, in this case, um, because we were planning at one time of even having it in 24, um, all of, we've got the federal highway approval, we've got our record of decision on the PD&E, we've got um, a little bit of work to do on the traffic analysis for our um, federal uh, review, but that doesn't take, that would take less time than it would take for me to procure the design build contract, so that's not a, a big item. So I don't think that, in fact, you know, we talked this morning, we could probably have that project ready to go um, within a couple years, um, mm -hmm. maybe even less than that, two years, if the money became available. And that's why I'm thinking if we can find, you know, in the last time there was a stimulus, they built the big piece of 19, and they also built the connector, the I-4 Selman connector. And um, a lot of places went out and built a, little, a lot of little things, resurfacing and whatever they could put together quickly. We want to have projects ready so that we could do an impactful project as opposed to maybe resurfacing a bunch of roads that don't need to be, but we can get the plans done quickly or something like that. So we'll be ready. Could you also share your insights about what this means for pushing back the regional BRT program, um, especially I would think the, the West Shore inter interchange is integral to that, you know, as well as section two, but any insights or advice to us on how we can uh, try to move things forward while we're seeing these temporary pauses in the program? Well, we did, um, actually yesterday I, I uh, spoke to the Tampa Bay Partnership um, Leadership, Transportation Leadership Group, which has been a proponent of the Regional Rapid Transit Program. And um, a lot of the questions had to do with how does all this impact that. So obviously um, a big part of the Regional Rapid Transit pro uh, Project um, was going to leverage the highway work we were going to do to accommodate them in, in our right-of-way. And so um, any delay in our projects would be a a similar delay in theirs. The West Shore Intermodal Center, um, that's really tied to the interchange construction as well. So chances are that any public-private partnership or other you know, method we would use to, um, to develop that site would probably be delayed by the same amount as the interchange. So um, yeah, it has, it has similar delays to their project as well. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from our board? Um, okay, this is an action item. We'll go to see if there's any uh, citizens who wish to speak. Uh, Tina, is there anybody in the room who has indicated an interest to speak? No, ma'am, there is not. Thank you. Um, Sarah, are there any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak on the draft tentative work program? Good afternoon. Yes, we do have one person with their hand raised. Anyone else in Zoom who wishes to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or press star nine on the phone if you called in. Karen Mullins, I see you have your hand raised. I'm gonna unmute you at that time. If you could please state and spell your name and state your address and then you'll have three minutes. You should be able to speak now. I thank you, uh, thank you board. I appreciate the time, happy new year. My name is Karen Mullins. I live in Dunedin, Florida, M-U-L-L-I-N-S. I am calling, I am speaking on my personal behalf. I am extremely, extremely disappointed in the Florida Department of Transportation and their decision to reallocate funds from our, our uh, regional um, program to move them to a more uh, uh, conservative uh, areas. I feel at this time, and we were told over and over again that um, through, um, I'm sorry, through our uh, consultants that this year would be a banner year for this region because we have the Speaker of the House along with the Senate President, um, the the President of the House and the and the and the Senate um, Senate uh, Samson. I am 
in the same boat, I, I, I concur with uh, Commissioner uh, Councilmember Rice as we need to move forward. Are we looking at other revenue streams to help us get through? The BRT was supposed to be our catalyst um, transportation for Tabarda and then for the, the region. This is being put on hold because of this back because of this backlash. Um, I'm also interested in hearing about there was some discussion about the um, Seminole Tribe Pact having money come from that by opening some uh, gambling opportunities for the uh, for the tribe to generate revenue that we the state of Florida has not um, tapped into for the past two years. Those are my concerns. Um, again, personal, I just want to make that clear. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Any other speakers in Zoom? There is no one else with their hand raised in Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will take a, uh, a motion to approve our five-year work pl program. Oh. I think I'm on, yeah. Uh, for the uh, FDOT 2022-23 to 2025-26 draft tentative work program. Whit, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to um, remind everybody that the motion we're really asking you to do is to authorize us to send a letter of comments on the draft work program, not necessarily to approve the tentative work program. The letter is in your packet. Um, so that's, it, it has both objections and praise for the department. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, it's a I big know, one. <laughs> otherwise, it's kind of a tough thing to vote for. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I make a motion to approve the letter. Approve the letter, and I hear a second. Yeah. And we um, we don't do a roll call for this, do we? Um, we don't need to do a roll call for this one, but I do want to clarify again also, if I may, that um, our advisory committees have not seen this letter. Uh, mm -hmm. They have not had this presentation on the draft tentative work program. They will at their next opportunity. And the deadline for sending the letter to the department is February 12th. And um, we next meet on the 10th. So if our advisory committees have any significant changes that the board wants to entertain, we'll bring that back to you for February 10th. But in the meantime, your action today gives me the ability to share that letter um, as I see fit as an official board action. Okay. Um, so we're not going to wait and hold it. Um, we're going to share it with who we need to, but we'll formally send the department the letter only after our advisory committee's weigh in, if that's clear to everybody. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could we also include in the document that we're sending uh, or, or alter it a little bit to include the uh, concerns that uh, Commissioner uh, Long addressed? Absolutely, specifically about the fact that it's our time and the disproportionate impact. I'd be happy to make sure that that gets reflected. Strongly worded. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Can I just ask that the people who made the motion and the second are agreeable to the changes as outlined by Commissioner Smith, for the record? That was a yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and a yes. Okay. <laughs> David. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We will move on to our next item, which is 7D. It's the Transportation Alternatives Program Grant Awards. Uh, this is an action item as well, and we will hear from Chelsea Favreau. and we'll get her a second to bring up her presentation. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Chelsea Favreau, Ford Pinella staff. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking to you about our transportation alternatives priorities. Uh, transportation alternatives uh, is one of the funding programs that Ford Pinellas, as the MPO for Pinellas County, prioritizes funding for. 
Uh, as Justin talked about, you know, the work program is developed around the priorities that are in part set by Ford Pinellas. This is one of those programs uh, for which we do um, set the priorities for. Uh, transportation alternatives are what we call TA. Uh, it's a limited program. Um, the, the, the scope of the projects eligible for it are quite limited, uh, as is the pot of funding. Uh, really, it's just focused on pedestrian and bicycle projects and those projects that uh, develop the infrastructure to improve non-driver access to transit. So it's really focused. Um, again, not a whole lot of money. Uh, we've heard from the Florida Department of Transportation that kind of the sweet spot for uh, these TA projects is between about 300,000 and about two or $3 million. Uh, if we were to add projects or prioritize projects that exceed that $2 million threshold, they may be very difficult uh, to program just because the needs would very much outweigh the availability of the funds uh, to construct those projects. So as the MPO, we do prioritize the projects and we do have uh, a great deal of latitude to structure the program how we, best, uh, how we believe it best fits our community. Um, so outlined right here on the screen is the structure that Ford Pinellas uses to prioritize projects and then submit them to DOT for funding consideration. We do submit or we do have a minimum award of $300,000 uh, that we ask the local governments to stay within. And that floor is really just because it does take a lot of time and energy and resources to put together an application and then to get that application all the way through to construction. Um, so we do try to focus on projects that, you know, maybe it's not a $30,000 crosswalk. Uh, the, the time and energy to go through this federal process would greatly exceed the amount of an award. So that's why we have the minimum award on there. And then a maximum award of $2 million, again, just because of the amount of funding available through the program. If we were to say prioritize a $7 million overpass for pedestrians, that would eat up about three or four years worth of funding and be very difficult for us to get programmed to get constructed. We do limit it uh, when, we, when we release the call for projects to two submittals per jurisdiction. And this really just allows us to focus on those projects that our local governments really have high priorities for, and we know that they can get done and we can get them forward and moving and get constructed. Um, we also have another requirement that after three years, any project that has not yet been completed or advanced will be removed from our priority list. We want to avoid having a lot of projects on our list that local governments say, okay, well, it's not really a priority now. Maybe, maybe I'll get more information next year to move it forward. That's not what we're looking for with this. We wanna make sure that these projects are moving forward. We also include a number of prerequisites for our program. We do require some kind of local commitment and we ask that, that either be a resolution from a governing body or proof that the project is included in a local government's comprehensive plan. Uh, if we are going to be funding these projects and moving them into the DOT work program, we wanna make sure that it wasn't just say an idea of the staff that isn't supported then by the governing board because when the money is available, we wanna make sure we can again, advance those projects and not have them tied up um, in any kind of uh, political decisions. Another prerequisite that we have is that we want to have proof that 100% of the right of way is available or an easement has already been acquired. Um, as many of you may know, trying to obtain right of way can be a very lengthy process and we wanna make sure again, we've got these projects going and they're moving forward and they're ready to go. Uh, the last prerequisite that we have is what's called LAP certif uh, certification. LAP stands for local agency program. That is a federal requirement because these are federal dollars, local governments have to take certain steps in order to be able to utilize these dollars. Um, unfortunately, this is something we cannot get around. And it is a little bit of a cumbersome process that some of our smaller local governments might struggle uh, to meet. Um, but this is one of the requirements that we have. And we did commit to our smaller local governments. You know, if they have a really great project, we don't want them to not submit an application for funding. And we're going to try to work with them. Uh, there are examples of times where Pinellas County has stepped in and constructed a project on behalf of a smaller local government. And the Florida Department of Transportation has done the same. Um, but these, these are the list of uh, uh, the pr prerequisites and the structure of our program. Now we release a call for projects each year. Uh, this past year, we released the call for projects in July with a deadline of, I believe, uh, September. And at the, uh, by that deadline, we did receive five applications for funding. 
Uh, the first was 118th Avenue in Pinellas Park. This stretches from Belcher Road over to 62nd Street, passing Morgan Fitzgerald Middle School and Pinellas Park High School, and also links up with the overpass across Bryan Dairy Road that runs north and south in that area. And that application was for a shared use path. We received an application from the city of St. Petersburg for 28th Street, stretching from 1st Avenue North to 5th, 13th Avenue North, right past St. Petersburg High. Uh, this application was for separated bike lanes uh, and intersection improvements. 46th Street North in the Lelman community, stretching from 38th Avenue to 54th Avenue North. Uh, this would be filling in sidewalk gaps that exist through that Lelman community. Another application for 62nd Avenue North, uh, South in St. Petersburg. Uh, this was from 22nd Street to MLK, and this would provide a shared use path um, on one side of the roadway in addition to intersection improvements. And then the last application that we received was from Pinellas County for 11th Street up in the Palm Harbor area. And that project went from Delaware to Virginia Avenue. And that was again to fill in some sidewalk gaps to create a continuous sidewalk in that area. Once we received the applications, uh, we met internally as staff to compare the project applications against the predetermined scoring process uh, that we have. These are the criteria up here on your screen that each uh, application gets reviewed against. And the, the criteria is really such that it doesn't just focus on transportation. We also wanted to focus on some land use consideration given the, the, the role that Ford Pinellas has as both the Pinellas Planning Council and the MPO. So we look at things like, does it have direct access to a multimodal corridor? Um, and direct access means to physically touch, just to clarify, or if there's direct access to an activity center. If it's identified in our bicycle pedestrian master plan, we gave some extra points so that we could help further the goals of our active transportation network. If it fills a gap, um, a, very, a couple of different point structures here, depending on the access to transit that the facility would have. And if it provides direct, direct access to an EJ area, that's environmental justice, those are our low income or minority areas throughout the county. And then the last criteria that we did, we looked at bicycle facilities separate from sidewalk projects, know that, knowing that inherently they're a little bit different. The map that you see on the right, what we did, uh, we did a, what we call level of traffic stress analysis of all of Pinellas County. And we looked at, given where a facility is, is if it a facility that would be acceptable for all ages and abilities, um, say like the Pinellas Trail, or is it for the strong and fearless, which is maybe riding your bike along Olmerton Road in a four foot bike lane. Um, so based on what that facility would create after it's constructed, it received a certain number of points. And then for sidewalk projects, again, those were scored separately. And it also depends on the condition of the sidewalk after completion. If it's going to be just on one side of the roadway, if it's gonna be on back of curb or separated by, uh, by a buffer from the roadway, it all impacted the number of points the application would receive. So these are the resulting scores and what we uh, staff and our committees are recommending that we advance. You'll notice that the fifth project is not on here. That was the 11th Street in Palm Harbor. That project only received a total of 35 points out of a maximum of 75. So we were not recommending that that project be advanced onto the priority list at this time. And this is the order at which we're, we're looking to advance them. You'll see that those top two projects did receive the same number of points as did the number three and four projects. The rationale for the order that they're in is that last year, the city of St. Petersburg submitted three applications for this program and all three of their projects were added to the priority list. Actually, in Justin's uh, presentation earlier, you did see that one of those was being advanced for construction and another for design. So since those St. Petersburg projects are moving forward, we really wanted to give the opportunity to some other local governments to tap into the funding sources. So that's why you'll see them listed in that area there. So again, the staff recommendation is that these top four projects be added to the bottom of the priority list. We'll be bringing that final priority list back to you at a later date for official action, but we really wanted to get the board's feedback now on this relative order before we get to the final stage of adopting it onto the official list. And that's what we're seeking for you, from you today is board approval of these recommendations. And again, a couple months later, we'll bring to you the final TA list along with your other priorities for review and comment. And with that, I'll take any questions. Chelsea, thank you for your presentation. We'll begin with uh, Council Member Gabbard. 
Thank you, Chair Rice. Uh, thank you, Chelsea. Um, wanted just to ask you on um, any application that does not get approved, do we have a conversation with the project sponsor, letting them know kind of where they could have done better, what we're looking for, so that if a project gets submitted again, they have a better chance of actually putting something together that would be approved? Absolutely. We actually sat down with each of the applicants on every one of their applications, and we walked through the scoring that we provided or that our staff determined their application received, and we talked through any kind of disagreements just to understand how that scoring was applied and why they may or may not have received certain points. So that was absolutely done. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Thank you for your report, Chelsea. I, I just have a question that I keep getting uh, asked when I'm out and about, and I wondered if there were any plans to fix the road between, um, on 102nd West or 118th or whatever you're referring to that road as, because it changes names several, several times after you get off the interstate. But, um, are there any plans to continue fixing it from, uh, let's say, 113th Street West? Yes, uh, Pinellas County, actually, I believe it's a pre preliminary engineering project. They're currently engaged in, a, in a, almost like a pre-design for that corridor stretching from 113th out to the west. So that is being looked at by the county staff. They did a really great job, you know, east of it, but they stopped right there at 113th Street and that west mm -hmm. section is a mess. Yes, and our staff is working closely with them on that project so that we can try to uh, make sure that active transportation and sidewalks, bike lanes, and even possible trail facilities are considered during the development of the project. That's great news. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other board questions or comments? Okay, um, seeing none. Uh, Tina, is there anyone in the room who has indicated that they wish to speak? No, ma'am, there is not. Uh, thank you. Sarah, do we have anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak on the Transportation Alternatives Program Grant Awards? Anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom at this time or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. We have no one wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll hear a, a motion to um, approve the uh, Transportation Alternatives Program Grant Awards. Okay, that was Commissioner Long, and do I hear a second? I see a second from Commissioner Gerard. And all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, um, it's unanimous, and we will move on to item uh, 7E, which is um, also an action item. It's our Forward Pinellas Board Committee appointments. And Whit, I, I know you're probably gonna do this anyway, but if for the sake of some of our newer board members, if you could kind of give us a, a quick lay of the land of what the TMA is, what's the CCC, <laughs> what do these acronyms stand for, and what is the role and the context for these uh, regional committees? Thank you, uh, I was gonna plan to do that. Who, who brought their cheat sheet with the acronyms? Uh, so the transportation management area is a federal term uh, for MPOs that are over 200, or urban areas that are over 200,000 population. We are an urbanized area that includes um, much of Hillsborough County, portions of Pasco County, and almost all of Pinellas County, all but a very tiny sliver. Uh, so it's one urbanized area, and throughout the, US, there are very few exceptions. Uh, one MPO serves one urbanized area, but we have three MPOs serving one urbanized area, just like Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach have three MPOs serving one urbanized area. But a lot of, uh, a lot of the rest of the state and the country, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, since 1990, 
three or so, we have been coordinating regionally through some very formal mechanisms. And one of those uh, that was started more recently is the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group, or TMA Leadership Group. And it is comprised of three representatives from the three MPOs, Pasco, Pinellas, and Hillsboro, that meet uh, roughly four times a year, sometimes we've met more, uh, to prioritize regional transportation projects, basically the West Shore Interchange, for instance, and to come together to speak as one voice in, in, as a region. We also use that forum to coordinate uh, on our various transportation planning activities and uh, make sure that there's consistency across the region and that policy development and policy positions are unified across the region as best they can be. For instance, this board uh, at your November meeting approved a transit funding policy statement that came through that TMA leadership group. And our staff meet um, uh, as part of that group um, at least once a month. And then we bring those staff items to the TMA leadership group as a board. Uh, before COVID, we were meeting uh, in Hillsboro, in Pasco, and in Pinellas County. Since then, we've mainly been meeting virtually, but uh, you know that really can't continue if we're going to be taking actions as part of the TMA leadership group. Last year, we did a couple of things to formalize that body. It was really just a gentleman's agreement that we would meet uh, since uh, what, 2013 or 14 or so when it got started, Commissioner Seal. And um, last year, we formalized that as an interlocal agreement through the Chair's Coordinating Committee, which is the larger eight-county region that we'll talk about next. Um, so the TMA Leadership Group is now a voting body. Um, it operates, um, it, it previously operated by only developing recommendations that the MPOs then acted on, and we still probably will operate that way, but because it's now got its own interlocal agreement, they can vote and take actions as, an, as sort of a, uh, of a, a body on its own. Um, and their principal goal, as I said, is to develop regional transportation priorities to recommend to the Florida Department of Transportation or any other partner. It could be TBARDA. Uh, it could be other, any other entity that was implementing a transportation project. Um, historically, we've had uh, two county commissioners and a city representative uh, on that board. And um, I'm not sure I know who the names are of the Pasco and Hillsborough County representatives. I think they were taking action maybe this month on appointing their uh, members. The next meeting of the TMA leadership group is in March. Um, shall I go on on the CCC and explain that one too, Chair? Yes. Uh, yes, please. Although we will take the votes up separately. Okay. I think you're on a good roll, so let's <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Caffeine. The uh, Chair's Coordinating Committee is um, actually was created in statutes in 1993. and. Uh, it includes an eight county area that includes Citrus Hernando, Sarasota Manatee, and Polk County. Uh, and they have a statutory requirement that um, they make recommendations on a specific funding program known as the Transportation Regional Incentive Program, or TRIP. And the legislature made uh, any project eligible for TRIP funding, uh, it has to be prioritized at a multi-regional MPO level. So you have to have a partnership among more than one MPO uh, to make the recommendation for a project in TRIP. Um, that's its primary responsibility. It also uh, adopts regional transportation priorities for the larger region, including projects in the Sarasota Manatee or Polk or Citrus Hernando region. And again, it is sort of the umbrella organization with the TMA leadership group falling into a subcommittee role of that body. And if you're not confused enough by our regional collaboration, um, we also have a statewide organization called the MPO Advisory Council. And there are 28 MPOs in the state of Florida. Uh, and the MPO Advisory Council meets roughly four times a year in Orlando. Uh, there's a staff directors committee and a governing board. And they typically meet on a Thursday afternoon. The next meeting is January 28th. Uh, they are also meeting in person in Orlando. Uh, sometimes the meetings move to different areas of the state, but three of the four meetings typically are in Orlando. And that's a great body to um, understand statewide uh, policy from the department and the MPO's perspective. And what's unique about Florida compared to almost every other state in the country is Florida is one of the few states that has uh, rules and legislation governing MPO's in state statute. 
Uh, a lot of states don't do that, and they just defer to the federal rules and, and laws. And uh, it gives us a lot more clarity, but it also means that we have to be much more uh, able to work with the Department of Transportation as a partner, uh, because those statutes govern how we interact with the state on various things. Um, and um, we're one of the largest MPOs in the state of Florida, so our voice at the MPOAC is really important. And there is kind of a large MPO caucus uh, that um, really represents the major investments in transit uh, and um, other uh, significant policy. Because once you get above a certain size, you have more uh, what's called suballocation authority. Uh, you have more authority to spend money uh, without um, basically asking for permission from the Department of Transportation. And uh, so the larger MPOs do have an important voice, and I would hate for Pinellas not to be well represented on that body. So I think that's enough of an introduction, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Do we have any questions from our board before we move on? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I will entertain nominations and volunteers from our, our board members. I know that we have a council member uh, Long and council member Eggers who I believe are interested in continuing uh, to serve on the TMA. And um, I'm actually gonna be stepping down and uh, I think it is helpful to have a city representative uh, in the mix as well. And um, so we're, we're taking uh, nominations for all three or just for the one uh, it's, replacement? Well, it's for all, we have to appoint everybody. And I'll also okay. say that Commissioner Seal has expressed interest. Yes. Uh, she was an inaugural member of the TMA leadership group. Okay. Uh, I like Vice Mayor Alberton. And, yeah. and David Albritton has expressed interest as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'd like to throw my name into that. Thank you. Okay, so we have, um, and so we have Commissioner Seal, Commissioner Eggers, uh, Commissioner Long, and Vice Mayor David Alberton, Alberton sorry. I will get your name right. <laughs> um, so that's four people interested in three positions. And uh, just as a note, um, we do have, like all board members can step in as an alternate. I know we've had a, a council member, uh, Gabbard, express interest as being uh, a backup member as well. It's helpful that we set in the bylaws that we can send any of our representatives to be a, to fill in and that's really just, that really helps us with the flexibility to reach quorum. So we, that was a very smart thing, whoever thought to write that in there. But um, we will, um, uh, I'll hear nominations uh, from the board. Do we want to do one person at a time or just? Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. I move that nominations close and I would like to make a motion that we, um, well, I guess I can't. Well, I think I'd like to see uh, Councilor Gab Gabbard and Councilor Albritton serve as alternates, if that's possible. So you're nominating uh, Commissioner Seal to be the third, the third member. Okay. No, um, I'm not interested. I, oh. When you may mention my name, I was like, oh, because I thought um, I was maybe going to be talking about the MPOAC. Oh, okay. oh fan well, fantastic. I, I, I okay, so I will remove my name from the TMA. Well, then this just became very <laughs> easy. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So then, uh, Council Member Long, what, could, would you like to change your, your motion? Yes, I nominate everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we nominate everybody. And Councilor Albritton, I mean, we can all go, right? Anybody can go, as an, anybody can go to the meetings. Yeah. They're open meetings. It's very interesting. Yeah. Lots of interesting personalities. So just so I we know say. how we proceed, are you suggesting that you... Commissioner Eggers, and then um, do you want to pick one or the other, Albritton or, or Brandy Gabbard? Because all members can be alternates. We don't need to pick an alternate. Councillor Albritton. 
I thought we were appointing three members to this group. So we really aren't entertaining alternates at this time. We still need a third member. Well, that is three, isn't it? Myself, commission. Oh, you got out? What's wrong with you? Oh, well, okay. Ladies first. Well, I misunderstood. I apologize. Wouldn't she be a regular member? I mean, one of them needs to be a regular member and the other an alternate. I mean, really. Yeah. Doesn't really that matter your, with that group. Yeah. Okay. Is that what your so the, the, the motion I think that I heard is the motion for Commissioner Long, Commissioner Eggers, and Vice Mayor Alberton to serve on the TMA, and we will recognize uh, Council Member Gabbard at the top of the list for our alternate. Correct. Tina, does that work with you? Okay. That's what uh, Council Member uh, Gabby said she wanted, right? And I need a second. I, I think uh, Commissioner Gerard beat you to the punch there. But we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Excuse me? Oh, do I need to do public Liberate. comment? Okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You guys uh, have patience with me. This is my, my first meeting I've chaired, so I do need to take public comment. Tina, do we have anyone in the room who, uh, from the public who wishes to comment? Do we have anyone in the room at all? No, yeah. there's nobody that wishes to comment. <laughs> and uh, Sarah, is there anyone in Zoom who would like to comment? Anyone in Zoom who wishes to comment, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or press star nine on your phone if you're calling in. We have no one who wishes to speak on this item. Okay, so um, uh, Commissioner Long, your motion is to, um, to recommend uh, Commissioner Long, Commissioner Eggers, and Vice Mayor Alberton to the TMA with Brandy Gabbard as our leading alternate. And our second was, again, from Commissioner Gerard. All in favor? Any opposed? Great. Thank you. And Thank you all for stepping up to serve on the TMA. It's something that I really enjoyed and I learned a lot from having that perspective of sitting on that regional board. So I think you guys are gonna do great. Thank you. So our next, um, our next decision is CCC and um, we need to make a decision about our app one appointee to the CCC. And it would probably be good if it was one of the TMA people, either primary or alternate. You have Brandy Gabbard. Council Member Gabbard. So currently, Commissioner Eggers is the alternate, correct? Correct. So I would make a nomination that Commissioner Eggers be the primary. Do you accept? It's going to be difficult for me to make these other meetings, oh. um, so I'd really rather step back from the CCC uh, and the MPOAC. I withdraw my nomination. Thank you. In Council both. Member Rice, are you not wanting to be on that? Um, I've served on it already, and um, I just foresee um, it's going to be difficult for me to keep up all of those commitments this year, so I'm stepping aside for some fresh leadership. Are you going to be busy this year? <laughs> um, hmm. It's two meetings. It is a two year, meetings right? a year. One in July, one in December. Well, I'd like to nominate Council Member Gabbard then. <laughs> I will accept your nomination. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and do I hear a second? Second. Okay, great.
Great. Oh, and let's go to public comment, seeing I don't believe there's anyone in the room who wishes to speak. Sarah, anyone in Zoom who wishes to address the board? Anyone in Zoom who wishes to address the board on this item, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. We have no one who wishes to speak on this item. Okay, and we have a motion and a second. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Congratulations and thank you for stepping up, Council Member Gabbard. Uh, and do we need to take a vote for an alternate? Okay. So we will move ahead to uh, making a decision on the primary and one alternate for the MPO AC. And I think we just heard from, uh, from Commissioner Eggers, who's the current representative, that he will be stepping down. So um, I will be stepping aside as well. So that leaves uh, Vice Mayor Cookie Kennedy as the alternate. Are, are you interested in s stepping up? Oh, and Commissioner Seal is interested in MPOAC. I have two classes this, this semester. Okay. But so if you'd the, like to do it, Mayor Kennedy, no, I'm more than happy. No, no, no. I, I have two classes <laughs> I'm in, and I, I, I'm already the head of the um, waterborne transportation. So I, I would prefer if you would do it. I'll be alternate. I, I know there's at least one meeting I can't attend in the summertime, so... Um, but it looks like the other three meetings, since they're in the afternoon, I probably can make those. I, well, I could probably do the summer one then for you. Okay. Because I'm like my it's two in classes. July. That that would be fine. Okay. If you want to switch us. Yeah, or or make a motion. Um, I make a motion to have Commissioner Seal on the MPO AC, and I will be her alternate if that's appropriate. Okay. I think that's appropriate to nominate yourself. Second. Okay. I second that. And, okay. And I hear a second. So all in, oops, public comment. So uh, there's, I don't believe there's anyone who's joined us new in the room to speak. Uh, Sarah, anyone in uh, Zoom who wants to address the board? Anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak on this item, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine. We have no one wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. say aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, and congratulations, Commissioner Seal and Mayor Kennedy. Thank you very much for stepping up. Uh, now we're going to move on and I'm gonna turn it over to Whit Blanton for the director's report. Uh, thank you, and I'll try to get through this fairly quickly. Um, I did want to give everybody a bit of an update. Um, we heard from the Department of Transportation on the work program, and they've been really helpful in one of our emphasis areas, the enhancing beach community access on the Dunedin Causeway. Uh, the Honeymoon Island State Park is uh, the most popular state park in the system, and that causeway does back up uh, quite a bit on popular weekends and, and uh, during peak season. So we've been working on putting together a kind of a package of different transportation improvements. And we, I thought we, were, we had everything we wanted funded. Uh, the, the department has put money into the work program in FY23 for the intersection at Curlew and Alt-19. Um, we have been working with the Department of Environmental Protection on the entrance at the Honeymoon Island State Park to expand that entrance uh, and allow more capacity for vehicles to get in and out of the park, because that does create a real bottleneck, particularly as people pay and sign up for annual passes and things like that. Uh, we had money funded for construction in the current work program, but I learned on Monday that it was a casualty of the COVID budget impacts, and that has been removed from the work program for this current fiscal year. Again, like uh, the secretary mentioned, we're hopeful that that project on DEP side will get back into the queue next year, and we're gonna continue to advocate for that. In the meantime, the Florida Department of Transportation awarded Pinellas County funding through a county incentive grant program for the advanced traffic management system, which would lay fiber optic cable and install cameras uh, and signage along the causeway and the approaches to the causeway on Alt-19 and Curly Road to alert people when the parking, parking lot at the park fills up 
uh, and the parking lot closes, uh, or when there's a long delay getting into the park and giving people an estimate of how much time it will take on the causeway so they can make other plans or abandon ship or do whatever they need to do. So we think that those are really great projects. That's funded in FY24. Uh, in the meantime, the department and the county are working on an additional crosswalk uh, to be installed at Frenchie's Outpost, uh, and that should happen in the near future. So a number of safety projects. The only thing I'm still unsure about is we wanted to expand the turnaround at the park entrance uh, so that it could be a little more negotiable for larger vehicles, and um, I don't quite have an answer of when that will get funded, but I hope it will happen soon. Um, just an update on the Indian Shores, Indian Rocks Beach sidewalk and drainage improvements uh, that we've been talking about for a while. The department is about to begin the PD&E reevaluation or alternatives evaluation out there. Uh, they have a, a contractor identified. They are finalizing the scope of work and they expect to get started shortly on that. And I know uh, Mayor Serrano wants to come and speak to the board and ask us to bump that up even higher on our priority list. So you may hear from the mayor in the next couple of months as we talk about priorities. <clears throat> the, uh, I've already talked about the status of the aerial gondola project. I mentioned that T-BARDA is advertising that RFP, so I won't say much more about that. Uh, we uh, are taking to our advisory committees, uh, I believe this month, if not this month, next month, uh, an update on the frontage roads plan for US-19 from Pinellas Park all the way north uh, through Dunedin, Clearwater, Dunedin area. Uh, the department has been working um, really well on identifying some safety improvements and speed management on those frontage roads. If you've ever tried to drive 35 miles an hour, you will get run over. Uh, and if you've ever tried to cross the road, it's a little shaky too. Uh, so I think they've got some really good recommendations. They've been working through a study management team we will bring that to the board for a preview uh, probably in March, April timeframe, and then that will be a topic of our workshop that we have later in the summer when we focus on US-19 and the northern um, uh, interchanges and uh, innovative intersection ideas. So that frontage road kind of goes part and parcel because the, what they're doing is the retrofit of the existing frontage roads will inform the design of the future frontage roads as they go north from 580. Um, so I, I think it's helpful uh, for that reason, too. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the Gandhi uh, Park Boulevard interchange. Um, again, the department's plan is to add a second southbound left turn lane uh, that would relieve the queuing that happens for people trying to get over to 275. And all we just want to do is make sure that there's a safe routing plan for the bicyclists and pedestrians in that area because that, there's a lot of activity uh, on foot and on bike at that interchange. And if we're removing the bike lane for 1,800 feet to accommodate that left turn lane, um, it, it's not a problem for me. I don't see too many bicyclists using that. They tend to ride on the sidewalk, but it's kind of not on brand. And I would like to have a, a safe routing plan elsewhere because we also have the 28th Street Trail coming up on the east side of that interchange. And over time, we want to make sure there's a safe connection to that as well. So we had a meeting with Pinellas Park. They were gonna do a little more due diligence and come back with some options for us. And then we will let the department know what to do. But that's about a million dollar project, about 900,000 to a million dollars. So it could be done pretty quickly. And again, I think trading off the bike lane for the left turn lane is a smart thing to do. Um, I finally, I just wanna mention that everybody uh, in the Gateway Master Plan Partnership has adopted the Memorandum of Understanding to commit to implementation of the Master Plan. That's a significant accomplishment. That all happened, I think, in October. Uh, so we're gonna be recommending to you um, at your workshop in, in, later this month to take that off of our Spotlight Emphasis Area list that we created in 2015, and that creates some space to maybe look at another area of emphasis in Pinellas County. I also think we could probably do away with the beach access emphasis area, Mayor Kennedy, don't hit me, uh, because I think we've got enough things in place and in motion that are gonna kind of resolve themselves. And uh, again, if we wanted to have another emphasis area, we could do that. So um, the workshop um, that we'll do on the 29th, I hope everybody can attend. We'll keep it to about two hours. The goal is to have about half an hour of orientation 
uh, on our funding strategy, our funding sources, maybe funding strategy, um, our organization structure, and then really it's a goal setting opportunity for this board, really how we wanna um, govern ourselves over the next two years. Uh, the new members who just came on board are here for two years, so it's a good opportunity to uh, help set the agenda for what we want to accomplish in the next couple of years. What you like, what you don't like about what we're doing. Um, let's see, the next item uh, I want to bring up is our legislative committee update. And our legislative committee met again this morning to review the uh, priorities that they recommended at the November meeting. And so the action item that you have, um, we have actually three action items on the legislative update. Um, is to recommend the policy priorities uh, to the board for adoption. And uh, we also will need to appoint um, an additional member of the committee due to uh, Commissioner Egger's uh, conflicts uh, at 11 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. On, on this day when we typically have that meeting. We wanna keep you on the board, Commissioner, and so when you're able to join us, please do. Um, but I think it would be good to bring another, uh, potentially another county commissioner because all the other remaining members are city representatives. And then uh, the other motion would be to consider a new chair since Dave Eggers has been the chair of that legislative committee. Uh, in addition, the, um, the legislative committee heard a couple of new bills that have been filed. Uh, one on building design that we opposed last year. Um, that limits local government's ability to inform uh, certain aspects of residential building design. Um, again, uh, a home rule overreach. And then uh, we heard something on uh, wireless um, devices, prohibition of using wireless devices while driving. Um, and we, we understand their support from uh, President Simpson in the Senate for that bill. Um, so we talked about those. We didn't make any new directions other than to generally affirm the legislative priority positions. So uh, Mayor Kennedy, do you wanna add anything yeah. or Council Member Gabbard? I'd like to make a motion for chairperson for Councilperson Gabbard. And I'd like to make a motion for our County Commissioner, Janet Long, to come along our board, our legislative committee. And um, that would be my motion, but I have something else to say after that. So is there a second on that? Forgive me, Mayor Kennedy, but typically the committee would select their own chair, not the full board. I nominate Cookie. <laughs> no, I, no, no, no. <laughs> I thought we don't do it that way. Um, this is an action item, and I believe the committee did select uh, we did. Council we Member already, Gabbard we did. as okay. chair. We did. And our, our, what we need to do today is to approve the legislative policy priorities and the one pager for distribution. And I believe we can do that all in the same motion. Mm -hmm. okay. I think so. Okay. Additionally, we do need to appoint an additional member to that committee. That was her motion for- That was my oh, motion. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, so we do need to- With, with all the other priorities, okay. legislative priorities. And the suggestion was to have a county commissioner. Yes. And so Janet. your your motion, would you care to correct to um, just Janet Long nominate Com commissioner. commissioner Janet Long. Yes. I second. So just to clarify, that's a motion to approve the priorities <laughs> yes. and to add Commissioner Long to the committee. Correct. And the one pager for distribution. Yes. That's the priorities, right. Oh, oh and okay. the one pager for distribution. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Are we all good? Yes. yes. Okay, and did I hear a second? Oh, thank you. Uh, we have a second. So all in favor, uh, say public, aye. Public comment. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, before we go on, Madam Chair, before we go on, I just wanna ask a couple, two questions about the legislative committee. Before you do that, we need to take public comment on the okay. motion, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, seeing no one new in the room has joined us for public comment, we'll go to Sarah. Is there anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak? Anyone who wishes to speak at this time in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine on the phone. There's no one who wishes to speak on this item. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, back to you, Mayor Kennedy. 
Um, do we have a certain amount that we have to have, or can more individuals that are on this board, regardless if they represent cities, come on the legislative committee with us? We don't have a cap on members. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just like to do an outreach to anyone who's on this board, and, and if you are new, to come on that committee with us. It's a good beginning. You learn all about... a a, a lot of the issues <laughs> that are happening. Specifically, I'm going to call out Council, Councilman Commissioner Smith because we're going to be talking about affordable housing. And I brought it up today that we have Clearwater, we have St. Pete, and Largo should be involved in that because you have done an outstanding job. Your your commission and your staff with the affordable housing, and I think personally that you should be on that committee. Is there a possibility that you can come on that committee with us? And even for Pinellas Park, I mean, I, th I think that these are important issues that represent your communities, and I, I think it would be a great idea for some of you to come on uh, the committee just to learn about some of the things that would be affecting your cities. Mm. If and, it helps their decision making and, any, I just want to point out that, that that committee is the one committee that meets on the same day as the board. So yeah. it meets just prior to this, which is the most convenient committee that we have, really. And I recall you guys have lunch ordered mm -mm. and you work through lunch, not anymore? We okay. bring your lunch or you But you can bring your lunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Bring your own lunch. Okay. Chair, I, I would be interested. In, yeah. in Excellent. <laughs> And, and I would like to be interested, too. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So, so how about if we do this? Um, how about if we just invite you to come to the next meeting of the Legislative Committee? And then if, if you want to continue on that, then the board, I think, needs to appoint them to, to be able to vote on the committee. Chelsea, is that right? So we would need to take action to make you a full-time member. We can do that now if that's the board's preference, uh, or we can just do it, you know, at a future meeting. I'd be more than happy to nominate both of the incoming um, Commissioner Smith and... Noble. Oh, no. What's her name? Lonnie Noble. Okay. okay. Yay! Oh, All right. Terrific. They're going, he's going to love me. Not. No, it's okay. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I have a motion on the floor that we and already heard public comment for. Now this is a new motion? Yes. So she's, um, she's now amended her motion to uh, add Commissioner Janet Long, Commissioner Michael Smith, Council Member Bonnie Noble, and Council Member Patty Reed to the Legislative Committee. Awesome. Along with approving the legislative priorities and the one-pagers. So and I'll second that again. Great. Do we need to go back to public comment for that? Is that a substantial no. change? No. You're good. Okay. We're good. Okay. We're, We're all vote. good. Okay. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. I have two more items. Uh, way to go for stepping up. Thank you, guys. And Whit Blanton. Okay. Back to you. Final two items. These will be brief, I promise you. No action. Um, on February 28th, we have our uh, certification review by the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, if you haven't figured it out already, we are a highly regulated uh, organization, and we have to ensure to the federal government that we are meeting the expectations and obligations that we have as a metropolitan planning organization. So they are only looking at that side of the organization. Uh, the PPC is a state-created organization. And uh, that really process started about four or five months ago when they did a desk audit, which means they reviewed all of our plans, our long-range transportation plan, our unified planning work program, our transportation improvement program, our public involvement plan, Title VI plan, all those things. And, um, and then they sent us a questionnaire that we responded to. Chelsea Favreau of our staff has been leading that effort. So on the 28th, they have a half-day meeting with us to um, ask questions, uh, give us an opportunity, present some items to them. Uh, in preparation for that, we are having a webinar tomorrow uh, that you may be interested in hearing. Uh, Rodney Chapman and I will be uh, doing that webinar along with Chelsea, and we will be discussing what the MPO does, uh, what some of our priorities are, some of our major planning activities, and we will be taking questions from the general public. 
and it'll be fun. It'll be great fun, and I'm sure it'll be highly entertaining as well, and I'll try to crack jokes. Um, but that webinar is really helpful because the comments and input that we receive, we will share with the federal review team when they're here. On, not, they won't be here in person, but it'll be a virtual meeting on the 28th. And then uh, the, the, the grand finale of this process, which we do every four years, is that they will issue a report with findings and then they will come and present to the board and, and tell us what they think of our MPO and our operations. The last time we did this in 2017, um, they had a minor thing that they wanted us to, to look at in our public involvement procedures. Uh, it was not, um, it, it wasn't a, a negative finding, it was just we'd like to see more of this emphasized. And then we had seven noteworthy practices, which I'm really proud of. So um, I'm hopeful we'll have more noteworthy practices. Uh, and uh, they are also reviewing the Pasco MPO and the Hillsborough MPO around the same time because they are doing the review of the urbanized area TMA. Um, there's that word again. Um, and uh, unless anybody has any questions, it's the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration that's that review team. Uh, and we also have an annual certification with the Florida Department of Transportation that is a different separate piece of that, but that's also undergoing uh, a process now, and that's all done by questionnaire, and, and then they come and they look at our financials and make sure that we're charging expenses correctly and charging time correctly and things like that. And again, we're pretty transparent and uh, very open in our operations, and we have to be by law. And we are also going, uh, uh, undergoing our single audit of the MPO and the PPC at this time. And that audit procedure is um, something you will approve at your, probably your March meeting uh, for both agencies. So I just wanted to kind of cover those aspects. Um, the last item on my director's report, and that, well, I do have one more, is um, House Bill 1339 implementation. Uh, that was a piece of legislation passed last year that removed a provision effectively of the countywide rules where um, we try to preserve an industrial and employment land from encroachment by a, any other type of use, uh, and we really need to preserve that employment base in Pinellas County. Well, the legislature passed a law last year saying we couldn't do that anymore, that if affordable housing was going to be proposed, uh, any local government could approve it um, in an employment area, commercial area, or an industrial area, notwithstanding any local provisions. So um, it's coming, and St. Petersburg has expressed some interest in looking at that. I know Largo and Clearwater have both expressed some interest. So what we have pledged to do is conduct a little research effort of how are other cities and counties um, approaching this in, in terms of what considerations they make in their decision-making process to enable affordable housing to happen in a commercial area or an industrial area. And we wanna make sure that we don't isolate affordable housing in areas that are not accessible to transit, for instance, because transit doesn't tend to serve industrial areas. Um, we wanna make sure that there's a trail or safe access nearby. Uh, we wanna make sure that noise and pollution aren't factors that um, would undermine not only the affordable housing residents, uh, but also maybe um, uh, end up getting people to make the employment and commercial go away over time, kind of like moving near the airport. Um, so we've pledged to work with our large city and county planning directors on this process, and the research effort, which would probably be anywhere from five to $7,000, would be to use one of our planning consultants to conduct some best practice research and case studies and bring that information back probably by April. And we have a scope of services that we will um, release to one of our consultants um, after I review it, and um, we will authorize them to begin work later this month. I know Pinellas County is really interested in this as well, so um, just wanted to give you a heads up about that effort. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Whit, for the, uh, for the update. Um, in, and I think there are some areas within our county um, that um, certainly, I guess, warrant <coughs> consideration for that switch, uh, partial or all. I, mean, I would imagine, like, there was a piece of property in Dunedin that was switched from light industrial to anything but that. It was multifamily. And the, and the ask there was in return that I guess there would be some job creation for, from some office development. But it really wasn't suited for light industrial. 
to the extent that that exists, I think it's a good thing, and I certainly hope the cities, you know, look at that. But if to the extent that it really is suited for light industrial, I just would, you know, implore the cities to, to, to think really hard about, you know, we're trying to get more jobs and better jobs and raise the wages of our residents in this community and to preserve that as much as possible, understanding that there are some areas that just not suited for light industrial and that change is more natural. but. Yeah, it was uh, so anyway, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. And I'm glad that we're going to be participants in those discussions. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at the beginning of this meeting today, I <coughs> the chair was so efficient moving things along. I stepped out for one moment. When I came back in, I thought I heard the conversation that uh, Mr. Pressman was asking about some issues that he had been working on with us for over a year, but I did not hear any response from WIT or the staff, and I was just trying to, I was curious because I missed most of what he said, but it sounded kind of odd that he'd been working on it for over a year and we hadn't come to any conclusion. I wondered if you could just fill us in a bit. Sure, thank you. I was just get, you. I was getting ready to add that to my <coughs> report and address Sorry. that next. No, that's thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. Pressman approached me at that housing symposium we had in St. Petersburg, and I said we would be glad to look at it. Um, we have uh, this is the residential equivalency um, that is a calculation of density for for housing, and it is an affordable housing strategy. Uh, what we have not heard from any of the cities requesting this change in the countywide plan. Um, and so typically um, we like to be very respectful and careful in how we amend the countywide plan and, and do so in, in response to any direction that comes from or a request that comes from one of our cities or the county. And we've only heard this issue raised by Mr. Pressman. That doesn't diminish it, it's still an important issue. But what we would like to do is go through a process where we tackle several low-hanging fruit items as part of the affordable housing strategy, the countywide housing strategy that we're engaged in now. And so that's on the list of one of several things that we think we can do relatively easy and package them up, but we need to have a conversation with the local governments as we go about doing that. So um, it's really just been kind of a matter of timing to see how the countywide housing strategy evolves. And now that we've got a draft um, uh, memorandum of, of or a compact uh, for that, and we've gotten through the housing symposium, I think we're ready to move forward with, with addressing that. But it would be as part of a package of several items, and we're committed to doing that um, in the very first couple of months of this year. So it'll, it'll happen quickly now, but we just kind of wanted to get through that process and we want to make sure our cities are comfortable with raising that and, and want to see that happen. So happy to address that. Thank you. Good, Chair. Off that, uh, have you spoke to the cities and asked them if they're at all interested in, in, in something like that? Maybe it's not been on their radar? I don't think we've brought it up to the Planners Advisory Committee yet, um, but that is something that we will put on the agenda first thing. Okay, thank you. Yep. And that's, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Whit. Um, please make a note in your agenda of upcoming events, and especially, um, I imagine most of us by now have our calendars marked for January 29th which is our Pinellas, Forward Pinellas Board Workshop from 9 a.m. to noon, and look forward to having everybody there. Um, yes, uh, Council Member Gabbard. Can I revisit something that was talked about maybe about a year or so ago, but I haven't heard any updates on? Would that be appropriate at this time? Sure, go okay. right ahead. Um, so we had had a conversation, I guess it's maybe a year or so ago, about potentially putting together a work group that would study scooters and uh, possibly give guidance to uh, municipalities across the county who may be looking at doing a scooter ordinance. St. Petersburg already has ours. We've been working through, you know, the after effect Effect, bugs, if you will, but that is going very well. And um, it came to my attention through some conversation yesterday that there's a couple of communities out on the beaches that scooters have kind of started to show up 
and they don't have an ordinance in place. And so we're starting to see, you know, as St. Pete becomes more successful, more interest across the whole county. Is that something that we could revisit? I know that, you know, we've got Waterborne, we've got a lot of different things going, but I would hate for the scooters to kind of get away from us without having some level of organized, uh, I guess, plan or advice for our municipalities that might be interested. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. We um, kind of wanted to see how St. Pete's experiment worked out, um, but we'd be happy to, to address that. I like the word experiment. Okay, Con commitment to scooters, commitment to scooters. Um, and, and, and I think your lessons learned, and I, I think the city is doing a great job from everything I've seen with that. It, it's much more regulated than in other communities. Um, and uh, Commissioner Albritton or Vice Mayor Albritton, I wanted to ask you, did Clearwater ever adopt an ordinance? Yes, we did. We talked about it and it was an experimental ordinance, you know, a temp I guess temporary ordinance. We did a couple of them that never really, I've got to look into that because after we did had that meeting, I, it's like last I've ever heard of it, but I wanted to find out, there's no, no sense reinventing the wheel if we could get together with St. Pete, see how that worked out, then we can learn from that. So yeah, I think it's a good thing to bring it up again. We have had uh, city staff present to our advisory committees and go over the ordinance. So that's been disseminated to our technical staff. But I think having a conversation uh, with the board and, um, and kind of looking at maybe a countywide approach for lack of a better term, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, you know, we'll have to kind of fit it into the queue of things that we're working on, but I'm happy to have that conversation. Good point, Council Member Gabbard. As you know, St. Pete put a lot of work into our ordinance and we did put in a lot of restrictions based on uh, what we saw work and not work in other communities across the country. And we got pushback from the vendors, but so far I, I think that it's relatively working out really well. We're more than happy to share our information. Great. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So that covers the scooters. Does it also cover all of the various types of electric vehicles you see running all over the uh, sidewalks and stuff now? Um, Council Member Gabbard. It is a micro mobility mm -hmm. uh, ordinance. So it does cover some of those other things as well. Um, so yeah. I mean, it definitely, you know, you kind of have to put all those things together, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming real quickly, uh, that does not include any trail usage, It right? does not. Okay. They're geofenced so that it's not like they just stop when they go onto a sidewalk, but eventually it does power down. If someone's on their own scooter that they own, Obviously, it's not in the same system, but uh, St. Pete was adamant about keeping these off sidewalks and trails. I have a question. Yes, sir. I, I might be behind the eight ball on this question, uh, the, 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 the question, and then it could be put off. But um, earlier, it says on here that there was a second alternative to the, MP, uh, the MPOAC. Is there any interest? I'd be interested in that down the road if, if that is something that is an opening. We, we've had, again, I. I got to take this thing off. Um, <laughs> again, uh, I think it's really important that we have representat representation on the governing board. Uh, Commissioner Eggers will attest. Um, I, it's important that uh, our agency is, is well represented. So whenever he couldn't make it, um, I had to go one or two deep to make sure we had somebody there. And Susie Sofer uh, filled in a few times. So if you'd be willing to do that, um, we can certainly bring that up at the February meeting. We, you know, I think we're covered for January, so it'd be for maybe the summer. Yeah, I'd be interested in it. Okay. Just FYI. Great questions. And uh, seeing that we don't have any more comments, uh, thank you all very much, and we will adjourn our meeting. Thank you.